This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. An open session. In public now. Broadcast now, Stella, is it? Yes. Okay, um, I'll declare the meeting open. So, uh, number uh, item in your agenda there is uh, we don't have any any apologies in here. Um, item number three on the agenda is the draft minutes. I want to refer members to the draft minutes in the meeting on the twenty first of January at pages twenty six to thirty three in your pack. Can I seek agreement for the minutes? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Um, okay, you, uh, as expected, uh, because we're operating virtually, um, I will. Um, I can't physically sign them out, but I will sign them at the next available opportunity. Okay, um, and there's no uh, particular matters arising. Um, the next item on the agenda is number five, and that's an oral briefing from the department on the future of agricultural funding. Uh, I want to refer members to the department departmental briefing at pages 36 to 37 of your pack. I want to welcome by Starleaf, uh, Rosemary, uh, Ag um, Rosemary uh, Agnew, Director of Brexit, and David Reid, uh, the Finance um, Director. And I want to invite uh, Rosemary and David uh, to commence uh, their briefing. And, and obviously, following that, their members will want to ask some questions. So, Rosemary and David, you're very welcome, and please feel free to start. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, Rosemary, I can. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity this morning to discuss future agricultural funding. I do realise that this, some, this is something in an area where the committee had raised a number of queries during the last session. Um, as you indicated, I'm joined this morning by David Reid, the DERA Finance Director. Um, the committee has received, as you mentioned in your introduction, a written update on this particular area. Um, and I'd just like to give you a very brief overview of what's contained in that paper. And afterwards, David and I will be happy to answer as many of the committee's questions as we can. So the background was that in October 2020, um, HM Treasury circulated a replacement of Common Agricultural Policy or CAP funding paper which set out its view on the UK government's 2019 manifesto commitment to maintain the current annual budget to farmers in every year of this parliament. That paper advised that in cash terms, Northern Ireland would be entitled to budgetary ceilings of £293 million sterling for Pillar 1, £8 million sterling for CMO, and £29 million for Pillar 2 totalling £330 million sterling in each year of this Parliament to replace the funding that would otherwise have been derived from the EU budget. That paper also advised that as the devolved administrations will still be receiving some carryover Pillar 2 funding from the EU throughout the next CSR period, the UK government would net off this funding to ensure that the composite annual funding for each nation or each region met the same level as the 2019 ceiling, that being £330 million sterling for Northern Ireland. As a department, and similar to the position taken in the Scottish and Welsh governments, DERA fundamentally disagreed with the approach as Treasury was using the 2014 to 2020 Pillar 2 funding from a prior budget period to reduce the level of funding that it should have been providing in the coming budget period. Had the UK remained in the EU, Northern Ireland would have been receiving further funding from the 2021 to 2017 EU budget, in addition to that carried those carried forward funds from 2014 to 2020. Effectively, Northern Ireland and Scotland and Wales were being penalised for using the flexibility that existed under the N plus 3 rules of the RDP 2014 to 2020 to spend EU funding over a longer period in a prudent manner. As a result of Treasury, Treasury's approach to using the 2014 to 2020 Pillar 2 funding from a prior budget period to reduce the level of funding that it should be providing in the coming budget period, Northern Ireland will lose out on £34 million of funding over the 
2022 to 2023, 2024 period. Um, that was a case um, whenever all of these calculations were done. And this loss of the 34 million over the three year period, and this is a very important point, Chair, will not impact at all on the 2014 to 2020 Rural Development Programme, which will continue to run to its completion in 2023. It will, however, affect DERA's ability to explore new options and measures in a future agricultural policy framework or rural strategy framework. Treasury has confirmed that the replacement funding for Pillar 1, CMO and Pillar 2 will be ring-fenced in totality instead of individually, and the proposed allocation would be flat, ca flat cash in line with the manifesto commitment and not subject to an inflationary uplift. The spending review outcome was announced on the 25th of November 2020, and DERA is to receive £315.6 million to support farmers, land managers and the rural economy. The spending review allocation reflects the current position from Treasury and is, based on the discussions that we'd had with Treasury, what the department is and was expecting to receive. Uh, Chair, that's all I want to say is, uh, by way of introduction. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, perfect. Um, Rosemary, thank you very much uh, for, for, for that briefing. Um, I suppose this is something that certainly I've raised in the Chamber on a number of occasions, where I think it is very, very... Um, uh, it's, 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 it's mean... Um, you know that that thirty four million pound has been net netted off our rural development. You know we think as mean, and I think that you know, and you will know better than I know that 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 one of the reasons that some of the rural development pro ro projects were delayed during twenty twenty was because of COVID, and uh, as a result of that delay, you know, obviously this would contribute towards having the thirty four million there, but to not to effectively not allow us to carry that over. Uh, I think is it's mean and it's and it's a very bad precedent and and you know indications of the future as to how uh, we will be treated by the British government in terms of replacing uh, the, the lost uh, EU, EU funding uh, and I, I just think I think that's that, that's absolutely very re re regrettable. Um, I suppose one of the the questions I want to ask you is. See, in terms of the, the ceilings that we've been set here now, um, I, I, and which has been capped at the three hundred and thirty million, I note that in the um, in, in terms of the the south of Ireland, um, they, they have got ten and a half billion share of the new cap budget, and they're starting to thrash out their uh, national program for 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 that there, for spending that there, you know. Would you be have any concerns about the huge differential between north and south in terms of the level of support that's available, about what impact that may have on the ability of our farmers here and rural communities in the north to, to compete with the counterparts in the south? Okay. Um, Chair, I think if, if you look at it broadly for farmers, um, farm, farmers should... Um, receive the same level of funding moving forward, at least in the short term, as they would have received under the Common Agricultural Policy. Um, I haven't been following the detail of the cap allocations from EU in detail, but I understand that member states may have received slightly less than they did previously um, as a result of the UK leaving the EU. Um, but just in terms of answering your question about uh, North, South and farmers, North and South, um, we have recently set up a series of engagements, and in fact, the, the last one was actually yesterday, where we met with colleagues from the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine to discuss um, the support arrangements and the detail of the schemes that will be offered um, moving forward under CAP uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and we talked about our thoughts as to how we would move forward. Um, and you'll have heard the Minister outline some of these in the House. Um, so discussions are ongoing and we've agreed to continue those discussions at official level to try to ensure that there are no unintended consequences as a result of Northern Ireland no longer being part of CAP and the Republic of Ireland remaining as part of CAP. 
Equally, there are also a series of discussions ongoing across the UK with the English, the Scottish and the Welsh governments at official level to look at their proposals moving forward because we're still as a Northern Ireland part of the UK internal market. So all I can say to you really, Chair, is that we're trying as far as possible to have discussions to ensure that there are no unintended consequences and no, um, I suppose, disadvantage as a result of an unintended consequences to farmers, not just within the United Kingdom, but also across the island of Ireland. Yeah, um, I suppose just before I move around here, um, you know, there's a couple of wee things there. You know, obviously the the cap, the cap is as a multi annual budget. Okay, so you know, presumably there there will be a big impact in terms of future planning because we have no certainty beyond next year as to what the level of funding will be for the north. Yet uh, within the EU and the south of Ireland, you're dealing with a seven-year multi-annual budget period. So at least you can have some sort of certainty for the seven, for this, you know, for, the, for a seven-year block to plan ahead. And see as well, Rosemary, because it's not index linked, in real terms, are we talking about a, a cut? You know, I know it, the, the, the actual flat figure stays the same, but, you know, prices increase. You know, I'm, I'm certainly uh, with Brexit, we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing that there. So in real terms, you know, we're, we're talking about a cut here, uh, you know, despite the fact that the, the figures remain in flat. OK, uh, Chair, if I could maybe hand over to my colleague, David, just to respond to you on that one. David. David, we can't hear you. <laughs> we can come back to David. <laughs> um, no, I make it, uh, uh, sure, listen, we can come back to that question. I, I can, I'll give you a bit of an answer, and hopefully by that time, David will be able to answer the more financial aspects of it. You're correct, Chair. This is, these are annual budgets yeah. um, with no um, carryover into the future financial year. So it does, in many ways, change how we need to operate these schemes. These are budgets for an annual period and must be spent in year. We have no flexibility to carry forward. N plus three has disappeared. Um, we do know that the Conservative government have said under its manifesto commitment that it will maintain the same level of funding moving forward. So somehow or other, we would expect either via um, the allocation we receive from Treasury or the tail of the RDP to maintain 330 million euros over the period of the current parliament um, to cover what would have been in the past pillar one and pillar two. But it's a very, very different scenario um, to what we had been used with in terms of managing budgets. It's not for um, a complete period. Um, David has just said he's gone out and coming back in again, and he, he can perhaps, uh, we'll come back to him at a later stage to talk about the flat cash issue, if that's okay, Chair. It's okay. I'm going to move around the room here. Ro Rosemary? Rosemary Barton? Rosemary, can you hear me? Patsy, we'll go to you then and come back to Rosemary. Sure. Patsy Malone, can you hear me? Patsy? No. Uh, John, John, there. Can you, oh, sorry, who's that? Uh, myself, Patsy here. Uh, yeah, Patsy. There. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much for your presentation there, Rosemary. Now, I wanted to come to uh, point nine, and maybe this is David's uh, daily work, but anyway, I'll, I'll ask you in the meantime. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the issue of the ring fencing at point nine there, and the flat cash issue not being subject to an inflationary uplift. Um, th that surely is a uh, cause for concern as well. Have you any projections as to how much, well, inflation, you're looking ahead with inflation, but given average rates of inflation, how much that in practical real financial terms might cost uh, people here and cost the budget? At this stage, uh, Patsy, to be perfectly honest, we don't have those projections and that's probably a point at which I would have handed over to David Reid if he had been on the call. Yes. Um, you're, you're very right in what you say. It is ring fenced, so this budget must be spent um, on support for farmers, land managers and the rural economy. There's no opportunity should, let's just say, should an underspend occur that that money can be transferred to another part, another bit of the DARE budget or another portion of the DARE budget. Um, 
but the allocation is in flat cash. Um, David, I see you're back. Um, we've just had a question as well around um, not subject to an inflationary uplift and the impact of that inflationary uplift in real terms. If you want, maybe David, if I could bring you yeah, in. Sorry. Yeah, can sorry, you? can I just check everyone can hear and see me? Yep. Can you see me okay? Yeah. That's great. Look, apologies for the technical issues there. No, but yes, reason. Chair, I think you're absolutely right, Chair. In terms of um, in terms of a flat cash allocation, it does present inflationary pressures on the basis that you know for every one percent um, in inflation uh, that isn't met due to a flat cash allocation, that equates to approximately 3.3 .3 million of, uh, of, of a real terms cut. So that is something that needs to be considered and uh, possibly raised again with Treasury as we, as we progress through this. Okay, thank you. And uh, is David, I'll say go ahead. If we could just follow up, is, is that applicable to other budgets that's, that, that they're all ring fenced, other budgets that are coming across via Treasury? Are you aware through, say, the Department of Finance? In other words, I'm trying to make you could make back to Treasury about this because that's very significant. Whenever you add that along with uh, the stuff on rural development, the, the drop in funding on rural development there, the 34 million, and then I'm aware of another scheme uh, for TB where there's a very substantial drop in, in funding too uh, that hasn't been substituted or replaced. Um, you're looking at a mm -hmm. In the departmental budget, yeah, one of the other areas that um, we've um, obviously experienced some difficulty with as well is the fact that there is no replacement funding for the uh, vet fund um, receipts that we would have received previously from the EU, which over the next three years also presents us with um, a further financial challenge of 15.3 million. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how that's going to be managed, that hasn't yet been replaced by um, DOF or by Treasury, so it does present us with a shortfall. The extent that will depend on uh, at what level of spend we incur as a result of the TB program, uh, which is subject to fluctuation. You'll be aware in recent years it's topped um, 40 million pounds, but in the current year, we're anticipating that it will finish up at around 36 or 37 million pounds. But you're absolutely right that those present us with another financial challenge. And that's financial challenge in terms of um, issues from animal welfare, control of TB, all of those things. They are major concerns for, for people in general, but especially for the industry. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the department's approach, the department is basically managing the resources that it does have extremely carefully to ensure that its key priorities will be met. Um, and we're in the process of finalizing our uh, budget position for next year based on the initial allocations that we've got from DOF, um, which I'll be coming back to update the committee on in more detail next week. Okay, thanks very much for that. We'll, we'll look forward to hearing that next week then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ro Rosemary Barton, can you hear me now? Rosemary? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, Rosemary, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. you. Um, my concerns over the initially in the Northern Ireland Protocol under Article 10 to um, the agricultural products other than fishery and aqua products should have received TBP of 382.2 million. And yet, uh, as I said, in, you have alluded that we're going to get 330 million. Can you explain the deficit and how that will be made up? Okay. I think, Rosemary, um, we're perhaps confusing two different issues. Article 10.2 in the protocol is in relation to state aid and the state aid carve out that would um, be there for agricultural support. Previously under the EU, there was a state aid carve out for agricultural support as well. Yep. That carve out is set at a ceiling that is fairly high. So the overall carve out, which would not require state aid approval, is set at a new rate of 382 I think it's 382.2 or 0.3 yeah. million pounds. That will always be higher and always probably has been higher in the past than the actual allocation we receive from the EU and the allocation of funds that we receive. 
it is set higher just to give that additional flexibility. For example, should a case arise where we need to make a further case to Treasury for additional funding, there's flexibility for that. So it is, it is the amount of funding, the ceiling of the funding, that does not require a state aid approval. So okay. no state aid approval is required up to a ceiling of £382.3 million pounds to be spent on agriculture. Yeah. Okay, that's it. And again, I I share the concerns of um, of Declan and of pa Patsy in relation to the amount of money it not being it not being linked to a built in inflation or anything like that. I think there are major concerns there. Okay, we'll note that. Thanks, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. John Blair. John. Okay, welcome back to John. Let me second Claire. Can you hear me, Claire Billy? Hi. You hear me okay? Yes, Claire. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks for the presentation. Um again, Rosemary, this week. Good to see you again. Um I'm sort of thinking, I mean, it's quite a huge chunk out of the budget um that we're expecting this time round and i know that the majority it goes on um the sectoral support farmer support um but also the rural economy as you've identified as well and that we know that women in particular don't really benefit from the majority of cap funding in particular i suppose so i want to ask will there be equality impacts depending on where funding cuts come from um and will there be cut you know if the department have to make funding cuts, where will they be coming from and what are you looking at at the minute? Um, I'd be happy to take that one, Chair. Basically, in terms of where we're at at this stage for the next financial year, we're not anticipating that we will need to apply any cuts um, to any particular budget lines. Um, so at this stage, we don't expect there to be any significant equality impacts for the budget in 21-22. Um, but this is something that um, could change for future years, and it's something that we will have to um, keep on the review and monitor. And if we did find ourselves in a position where we're, we were having to consider um, cuts, that's something that would have to be subject to consultation. Okay, and there's nothing being um, muted in the department at the minute in terms of backup plans? Um, for the next financial year at this stage, we're not anticipating that we would need one. Okay, so the last one then. Is there any schemes in the Priority 6 stream um, that you think will be affected um, and any projects within that that, that um, could get an underspend? I'm not specifically, I'm not specifically um, aware of those individually, but that's something I think that's probably a, a question I could I, I could take away. But I would just I would just reiterate what it said there initially that we're not anticipating any cuts. But in relation to those specific schemes, I'm happy to take away additional questions, um, just in case there is something that I've potentially missed. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you, sir. Um, John Blair, can can you um, come back in? John Blair, can you hear us now? Terry, can you hear me now? Yes, John, go for uh, it. I'd love to mute an, an on-mute facility there briefly. Uh, I think Claire, Claire has, has covered um, what I was going to ask her. Apologies if I missed some of it while trying to find my, my audio controls again. Um, I'm minded that uh, there was another pledge of 350 million months in relation to something else, but at least this one of 330 million wasn't written on the side of a bus to be ignored at, at a later point. Um, I think we covered there, did we, the prospect of this coming from other budgets and that the position currently is we're not in a position now to, to know what that might be and think David maybe alluded to the fact it might not have to happen in the first year, but nevertheless there's a 34 million gap over three years and I expect it's going to have to come from somewhere or cut the resource that is there currently for, for this funding stream. 
I think it's probably worth just um, sort of referring back to uh, what Rosemary had said there in her introduction in relation to the, the impact that that 34 million has in the department. It doesn't affect what we're planning on spending on current schemes, but what, what it does do is it does impact our ability to develop uh, future schemes and allocate additional funding to programs that we typically would have expected to be funding under a new uh, multi-annual financial framework. So on that basis, it's it's more a case of the money not being there as opposed to the money having to be cut and found from other budget lines. Okay. So I think, uh, sorry, I was just going to say, uh, John, if I can, you know, we aren't the only region, uh, both the Scottish and the Welsh governments, and I'm sure you've seen that covered in the media, are also in a similar position in respect of the tails of the RDP being deducted from um, their potential allocation. Um, and just, you know, our minister has been very vocal um, in terms of his disagreement with how the calculations were done, as have the Scottish and the Welsh ministers, and they've collectively um, issued letters both to Treasury. So I just think it's important to say that at this stage to the committee, that um, all of that has been ongoing and is still ongoing. Okay. So we, we, we wait and see the outcomes of, of ministerial processes but remain mindful that there could be budgetary impacts elsewhere if we want to maintain what's there for RDP currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, I, just before I move on, like, I, I, the more I think about it, like, the more I think that that is as an attack on rural communities. You know, the department and the communities have been good and prudent use of the um, the money for the rural development program. You know, and for for that thirty four million not to be allowed effectively to be allowed to be carried over, I, I just think it's shocking. And that's that's money that's really going to be deprived out of our new rural policy, rural programs. And and I suppose I would say had the department had known this earlier that you probably could have looked at getting you know not not having that 34 million but i just think it's uh, it's it's just absolutely appalling that we're not allowed under the n plus three rules that we're not allowed to carry that over into the the, the, the new uh, budget period w william 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 can you hear us can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, William, we can hear you now. Right, there's a couple of issues um, in relation to TB, and um, I think it was mentioned that the, they weren't sure that the money would be available. Is it not a legal obligation for government to cover the costs of TB? I think, William, um, I've lost David. Um, you may <laughs> come back. Um, David, it would be perhaps best place to answer your question around TB funding, um, and we could maybe hold that one. He's going to try okay. and rejoin, so if we could maybe hold that question. In, in, there's, in David, there's, there's David mm -hmm. back now. David, did you hear the question around TB? No, sorry, uh, just, yeah, just back on technical issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. from yeah. living in a rural community, I'm afraid. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, Hello? can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In relation to TB uh, and fund to cover the cost of TB, is it not a legal obligation for government to cover those costs? Absolutely. And um, in terms of the TB program, that's an area of spend that we would ensure the funding was made available. That's what I thought. For, okay. um, and that the program itself will be properly resourced. So there's absolutely no intention to impact on it negatively. In relation to direct payments to farmers, uh, even in the past, under EU direct payments, I don't think that was ever linked to inflation, was it? The payments, for instance, if it was linked to inflation, the error wouldn't be cut by half percent this year. You know what I mean? So it, it obviously isn't linked. It wasn't linked to inflation in the past. Uh, William, right. could we take that question away and come back to you? Um, and just to check it out, I think you're probably correct, but I would like to take the question away um, and we'll come back to the committee with an answer on that one. I think it's a very unfortunate that, that, that there's a 34 million cut in relation to rural development. And um, I'm pleased to hear that the minister has been fighting that case. And uh, I hope there can be a resolution, a resolution to that. I think in relation to the 330 million, uh, that is promised for the lifetime of this parliament. 
Um, that uh, is not a cut. That is keeping on par with what has been we have had in the past in relation to direct payments and the rights. So, in actual fact, if we were still in Europe, we could actually have less than this if we look at in that right of this year. Yes, we, yes. We, we look at what happened down south, you know what I mean? Yes, you're correct, William. Um, the $330 million was the 2019 ceiling. Um, so the manifesto commitment is to maintain that same level of funding to farmers. Um, but Treasury have deducted from that the tails of the RDP spend. Yeah, um, but that was that was to be kept almost at a flat ceiling during the period of the Parliament. But our query or our challenge at the minute and our disagreement is how that calculation has been done. But had we remained in the EU with the budget cuts in, in the EU budgetary period, we could have been seeing a reduced ceiling um, moving forward. But, you know, it's probably not dissimilar to what's actually happening in practice in terms of re reducing the tails of the RDP spend. Um, yeah. So there, there may be a relationship between the two as we move forward. But again, we, you know, we can't, we can't give you figures because we're no longer part of the EU and we don't know what our allocation would have been. So it, it, all of this is a bit of a hypothetical. Yeah, yes, but of course, if you look down south, there, there is a cut, so we're we're been maintained other than real development. So it's not to say that for the lifetime of this parliament, I, that, that that no one knows how long that's going to be. Either. That's a difficulty, of course. And and just to pick up on the the queries around inflation that were commented on previously, obviously inflation still reduces the real time value of any funding, particularly as we move forward. Okay. Okay. William. Okay, we're going to move on to Philip. Moving up to County Antrim now from County Armagh. Philip. Philip. Yeah, I didn't hear. Um, we'll come back to Philip. Uh, Claire. Sorry, Philip. Yeah, go. My apologies. I went to unmute and I had to end the call, so apologies for that. Uh, <laughs> To be honest with you, it's probably getting a wee bit repetitive at this point. I mean, I just want to share the same views that have already been made. Uh, I mean, it's another day and another broken promise, uh, if you will, or at least at the very least a uh, sleight of hand from the British government when it comes to funding issues and promises made uh, with regard to Brexit. I mean, I, I just I share uh, the views expressed by yourself, Chair, in terms of the attack on the rural community. I mean, we all can point to projects uh, from rural development funding and that, that communities and rural groups ha have done that have enhanced their communities right across the north. Uh, and, and this is certainly an attack on that good work and, and in terms of an attack on our rural communities because, uh, as I say, of this reduced funding from the British government despite promises made. I mean, my, my question was uh, just kind of initially, I mean, because we, we've exhausted the funding issue, I think. In terms of next steps, I mean, obviously, uh, we have this pot of, of funding uh, and, and the next steps are to see what, what are the programs or policy positions that the money will be spent on moving forward. So maybe if I could ask Rosemary or, or David, you know, for a time scale on some of those issues or when we're likely to see uh, a bit more detail. Okay, um, I'll take that one maybe, Philip. Obviously, the majority of um, the funding would be spent on what we have, what we call the direct payment scheme to farmers. And you'll have heard Minister, um, and I think Norman Fultler and myself gave a presentation to the committee after the Minister's oral statement to the House in November around the Minister's thoughts and the Department's thoughts on what that future agricultural policy would be. Um, we're moving now quite quickly and Minister is very keen that we move quite quickly to start a conversation about the detail of what that future support would be. Um, you've had the detail of the simplifications that we wish to bring forward for the 2021 scheme year um, and that's really to simplify and make the, it, it's it, a baseline to move forward from um, and hopefully within the very near future, you'll be considering the statutory rules to bring effect to that. But then the further steps moving on ahead, um, Minister started to outline some of his thoughts around a, a, a basic income support payment. Um, very, very similar, but a simplified version of what the basic payment scheme is, and that would be a basic resilience payment. 
his thoughts around bringing forward a coupled support payment for uh, suckler cows and breeding ewes um, and future agri-environment schemes. Also linked to that capital support um, succession planning and um, the whole knowledge agenda and continuing professional development. Um, we will, um, over the course of the next number of months, be bringing forward to the committee various proposals that we would like to go out to consultation with to seek further views on those. But all of this must be in a logical, transitioned way for farmers to be able to understand the changes that will be brought forward. So we're really just beginning to start a conversation around that. On the rural policy side, um, I understand the committee received a presentation as well in November about the department's future um, rural policy, and I probably would defer to colleagues on that, but my understanding is that a number of pilot projects um, are being taken forward, and again, the committee has received an update on that. So I suppose, uh, Philip, in simple answer, work is at, early, at an early stage to look at what those new schemes will be. And we've really, as I, as I explained earlier in response to a query from the chair, we've started that by having conversations with other regions of the United Kingdom and with the Republic of Ireland around what they're doing so that we don't cause unintended consequences by bringing in very, very different schemes here. But um, as we move forward, probably into the next session, we'll be coming forward with a number of those proposals to take the committee's views on them. Grand job, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, and, and Rosemary, just putting you know, it's not there. Um, it, it may not be in your remit, but have you any indication? Because we, we expected uh, public consultation on the the new rural program. Is there any progress been made in that? Uh, quite honestly, Chair, I don't have a timeline. All I know is that they expected to go to public consultation early in the new year, but I don't have a timeline. And perhaps that's something we could take away and get you an answer, get the committee an answer on. Yeah, because uh, uh, like we've been expecting this from the autumn of last year, uh, the consultation on it. And I'm just conscious that, again, whilst the, the south of Ireland is moving ahead, well, they have a public consultation right now, I believe, in terms of tailoring their rural development programme. I don't want us to be seen to be left, be left behind in terms of moving ahead as well. You know, no, I, 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 I'm not... No. Sorry, Chair, I'm not in a position to give you a timeline, but happy to take it away and get you one. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Claire, you're looking back in again with a follow-up question? Uh, really, on what I was already asking about earlier, um, uh, because, of course, the $34 million from rural development is hugely significant, um, and it's impossible to see where this could be cut from within budgets without having a serious impact on local communities. So can I go back just to the Pillar 6 stream projects and the gender equality issues as well, or rather the gender disparity issues, I suppose. I know you've given us the commitment here that at present um, current budgets will be ring-fenced. Was that until 2022? Did I, did I get that right? 2023, 2024, the, the okay. end of Parliament. Thank you. Sorry, I got that year wrong. So can we be assured that any future budget cuts will not come from current um, Priority 6 projects? And um, what I'm sort of thinking of, so we're facing this um, $34 million, um, that was carried over that's now being taken out of the, the, the next allocated budget. So we will replicate that system, for example. So if there are ring fence budgets, by the time we get to 2023-24, if there's an underspend in particular projects, that we will be facing taking that money as punitive in terms of reallocating new budgets. But also the one other thing is, can you give us every assurance that, I mean, the cuts are going to come somewhere, this is going to be felt somewhere at some stage. Um, and can you give us every assurance that the department will continue to carry out the quality impact assessments on everything in the future. Okay, I, I think it's, as David said quite clearly, and, and I know he was going to say there, but I'll just ask to bring him in after I've finished. The 34 million and the reductions that we're facing over the next three years will not impact at all on the 2014 to 2020 Rural Development Programme. Um, that is fully funded. What the reduction in funding will do will reduce our ability as a department to explore new options and measures in a future agricultural policy or rural policy framework. So it will reduce our options as we move forward, not in any of the current schemes or current programs. 
I think in relation to EQIAs, we are required, it's a mandatory requirement that we undertake screening exercises on all new policies and all new schemes. So the department endeavours as far as possible to ensure those are completed. And I think that's, you know, that's as, as large a commitment as I can give you. And certainly any area of work that I'm involved in, I can assure you that all of those are completed. Uh, David, is there anything you wish to add? Yeah, I would agree with everything that you just said there, Rosemary. Um, and in terms of the current rural development program, that we will see that through to completion in 23-24. And in terms of the EQAs, it's an essential part of any budget process. So any um, potential negative implications for spending any area will, will absolutely be considered. Um, what we can't do is we can't give any kind of assurances beyond the current spending review uh, periods and that as well. So at this stage, like I have um, uh, the, we're working through the budget for, for next year, but beyond that, we have no certainty in terms of the uh, funding that we will receive from the Westminster government through the Northern Ireland Assembly, what that uh, will look like. So whenever we go through the next CSR process, we'll assess what the implications are then. Um, but in terms, just to kind of reassure the committee in relation to the current RDP, um, we are absolutely committed to finalising our spend on the current programme, which takes us through to 23-24. Thank you. Okay, Claire. Uh, Harry? Okay, Chair, thank you very much. <clears throat> First of all, I'd just like to say um, I welcome the fact that Ministerial talks are taking um, part of the other Ministerial Group for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs by, by our Minister, and every opportunity is taken uh, that the UK government fully understand our priorities and challenges at this time. Uh, a wee question would be, what capacity of the DERA funded operation would be ring fenced in terms of its legal obligations, Rosemary, in relation to TB testing, etc.? I'm going to ask, I, I can't answer that question because I, uh, I'm not involved in TB. I don't know, David, are you able to help? Yeah, I mean, in terms of ring fence funding, we don't have any uh, specific ring fence budget for TB or a majority of the areas that the department is responsible for. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, okay. Um, Morris? Morris? Um, and we would do that just to ensure that we've got appropriate flexibilities in place that allow us the money. Hello? Uh, sorry, sorry, David, cutting out there, he just finished off his answer, Morris. Right. All right, David. Okay. Uh, uh, Morris, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, it was the 34 million cuts that David uh, uh, was talking about there. He had alluded to actually no physical cuts required this year. But uh, are any of the cuts immediately likely to come from new programs proposed or will the shortfall mean the new programs will not be sought or that existing programs will be tailored down to suit the reduction, uh, reduction in funding? Uh, and can I ask either Rosemary or David, what are your thoughts going forward around the pathway needed in negotiations through ministerial meetings with Westminster regarding future funding? I'm thinking of new schemes that may uh, draw down uh, additional or new funding from Westminster that may uh, make up that shortfall. Okay. Um, I think on your first question, we've been quite clear that current schemes will not be affected by the allocation of funding. It is our ability to explore and take forward options under new policies um, that will be um, impacted. Um, having said that, we continue as a department to bid for additional funding. Um, and I'll bring David in at this point, wants to make a comment about the ministerial groups. Through the interministerial group, um, it's on funding. It remains a standing item on every agenda moving forward. So mm -hmm. the Dara minister raises it with with his colleagues at every meeting, um, as do the other devolved administrations. Um, and I should have said earlier that England is also facing the same uh, approach in that the tails of its RDP program are reduced from its allocation, um, and. I suppose the DEFRA Secretary of State has accepted that as England because it's a UK government decision, um, but it's certainly not accepted across the other devolved administrations and it's continued to be raised. 
Um, David, do you want to say anything about other bidding processes or perhaps that's best left to your update next week? Yeah, I mean, I can pack this up in more detail next week when we're um, specifically updating on the budget. But in terms of um, where we find ourselves in the current year, we work very closely with them, the department. They establish financial requirements for the year ahead. And we work very closely with our colleagues in the Department of Finance in order to secure resources um, for those uh, programs and projects. And at this stage, we're not aware of anything um, massively significant that we're not going to be able to uh, take forward in the next financial year. But it is worth highlighting, just as Rosemary has mentioned previously, you know, in terms of our ability to consider what programs we would like to uh, take forward in the year ahead. Um, that is considered in the context of the £14 million pound reduction that's been applied to the £330 million, so it does inhibit our ability to do that. In addition, it's probably worth pointing out that we do have a significant um, resource that we are putting on um, in relation to uh, basic payments, um, CMO and the RDP, but that £14 million does have an impact in terms of being able to develop new programmes or projects. Okay. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you very much, David and Rosemary. Thank you. Um, okay, um, as I've no other members um, indicating, um, I suppose I just want to, I suppose just want to conclude. Um, David, when you're on there, I wondered maybe you could uh, maybe mention, ask me. Um, see, in terms of um, the, the, the current uh, bids for, for the, the service team, that's currently available. Is the department working on any bids for any of that there, David? Um, at the minute, Chair, the department has considered um, whether or not there are any additional requirements, and we have actually carried out a number of internal exercises within the department. They identify additional requirements uh, that we could fund, but we've been unable to establish any significant need that would require us to submit further bids to the Department of Finance. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, so would that not be people not find that unusual that, that the department feels that there's that there's no requirement? You know, you know, surely the likes of rural community groups and others who have faced the, the worst excesses um, of the, the whole COVID during the year and all the work that they had to do and the pressures up at the moment was there there were going to be some, something uh, you know that the department could identify that you know for, in terms to try and address the issues. I know that there's certain sectors within farming that are carrying a, a loss from Brexit, or not Brexit from COVID. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things I would say, Chair, is that across the year we have allocated um, significant resources and sought funding for uh, for a number of um, things in relation to COVID, and um, where we have issued and allocated funding, and I'll provide a more detailed update on this next week in terms of specific figures. I don't have them in front of me, but I know they were in excess of £40 million. Mm -hmm. The difficulty we have at this stage is that anything we have paid out, there's been a very strong evidence base They support the need for the funding that has been paid out. But in terms of where we're at at this stage in the year, we haven't been presented with any additional needs. It's also extremely late in the year, so there would be a concern that if we do draw down money without having properly established the need for that money, that we would be in a position where that money wouldn't be spent by the end of the year and would effectively generate an underspend for the department. Mm -hmm. But I would like to reassure the committee that we have worked extremely diligently and very, very hard within the department, um, and that includes on the rural development side. Um, I know that the the folks involved there were working very closely with the councils to see if there was any additional funding that could be um, allocated to community groups or if there was any additional need. But unfortunately, that wasn't forthcoming. So on that basis, we weren't able to bid for any additional funds. I just think that certainly as a citizen's MLA is, we know the pressures that, for example, rural community organisations are experiencing with the, the shutdown of their premises, their inability to hold events, uh, carry out their functions, and they're still capital and still over running costs, uh, which is putting pressure on the organisation. These are organisations that were the forefront of the COVID response uh, during the course of the year, and indeed uh, our, our producers, our, the you know, our processors, 
our farmers, you know, who, who bore the brunt of the, who are bearing the brunt of the lockdown in the hospitality and hotels and the restaurants impacting on the value of their carcasses and the beef. I think I think it's I think it's astounding that the department hasn't identified some need emanating from the impact of COVID within the wider agriculture and rural communities. And I think it's something we need to revisit because it's it's I think it's actually astonishing that 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 that, that you're saying that. On the specific issue in terms of you know market fluctuations and changes in um, prices and the value of carcasses, not that 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 was um, one of the key factors that was considered when we were providing support. Um, I, again, I don't have the exact figures, Chair, because I wasn't expecting to be briefing on this today. So apologies, but the scheme ran at around 25 million, and the payments that have been made out have been based specifically on evidence um, of market fluctuations and changes in prices. Um, and we, again, uh, I can pick this up with colleagues internally in the department and provide a more uh, robust answer. But um, we are content that, you know, in terms of everything that has been presented to this and every need that has been presented to the department, that we've done everything we can to fund those. Yeah, well, I think it's something we need to pick up on, on next week, you know, because there are, there are pressures and we're actually we're moving on to the next item here now shortly on the likes of the Loch Ness Fisheries, which are still waiting, you know. So thank you, David, I suppose, um, um, for, for, for addressing that issue, which was which wasn't necessarily part of this briefing. So um, so I want to thank you, uh, David and Rosemary, for your attendance um, this morning. And... Um, um, oh, sorry, Philip. I see here, Philip. Did you indicate? Did you want to ask a question in relation to something to do with David Rosen before we move on to the next thing? As I see on the on the on the, watch, on the message here. Yeah, uh, it might stri strictly be uh, not not to be asked, but I mean, just the point that, that you made there in relation to uh, additional uh, requests for fund. I mean, w w the executive has has is going through a spending review. I mean, there is a substantial amount of money. You, you were very clearly making the point that the department probably could and should have been uh, requesting additional funds to, for COVID support. Uh, I mean, I, I think it would be useful, uh, and if it's not for today, that for very, very soon, that we kind of get what the department has done in terms of uh, additional submissions during this spending review. I mean, you, you kind of slipped of the tongue and said Brexit instead of COVID. I mean, there, Brexit has had a serious impact on businesses uh, on the agri-food sector. I mean, we're hearing daily, day and daily uh, the increased impact that on it. So it would be it would be useful to ask either Rosemary, David, have have, have they submitted any bids for additional funding, not just for COVID, but for Brexit-related issues or other departmental issues that that are uh, that are much needed. Yeah, I mean, I can take that one. Across the past financial year, there have been a, a number of exercises in relation to COVID and Brexit both. Um, again, I don't have the, the full details of everything that we've um, done in front of me at the moment, but that has included in relation to um, the uh, Brexit fund, and we have even at times been engaging directly with Treasury alongside DOF to secure additional funding for things like protocol costs, um, engaging as well on the issues um, quite robustly in relation to the 330 million and Treasury's um, move to cut that by 14 million. We've also been submitting additional bids in relation to uh, uh, additional costs that the department is incurring as a result of Brexit and securing additional funding for that as well. So there have been a number of exercises um, that have kind of passed over the, the, the last kind of 12 months. Um, David, we... not, to, not to interrupt you, but I'm, I'm thinking specifically this latest uh, review process going on. I mean, we heard the finance minister in the assembly talking about 500 million. Uh, you now, some of that's COVID related, but some of it isn't necessary. So I'm kind of specifically asking, has the department in the last number of days or weeks made any submissions to uh, the finance minister in relation to programmes or funding that c can uh, kind of compensate or help for the, f the issues that we've talked about? Um, again, uh, in terms of what we've been doing over the past um, kind of number of weeks, we, the process that we've been following within the department, is, that's something that we've considered um, in great detail in terms of whether or not there's any additional requirements or whether or not we've been able to identify further need to request additional funding. 
And in consideration of what has come forward, it's been very, very limited in terms of what we've been um, able to identify as additional requirements. And on that basis, we haven't identified anything significant enough that would allow us to put in additional bids to the Department of Finance. And just to reiterate the point as well, that we are very, very late in the year. And with about um, eight or nine weeks left in the financial year, our ability to spend that money would also be extremely limited because of the processes we would have to go through um, if we did identify anything significant in terms of getting things approved and actually getting the money spent in time. So any request for funding at this stage also carries with it a huge risk of underspend. But David, is that not the case for every department? Are they not all, every department not in the same position? Um, I would assume I would assume so, but I suppose the other um, aspect of this as well, Chair, is that we um, we haven't identified any additional needs that would justify requesting the, the funds. So there's kind of two sides to it. There's the risk of underspend and then there's the fact that we, we haven't identified additional needs. Okay. Um, well, well, thank you very much for that, David, for coming back. And this one we definitely need to revisit again. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you, David and Rosemary, for your attendance this morning. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. On to um, item number seven on, on the agenda today. It's a departmental oil briefing on the independent panel for review of uh, decisions. I want to refer no, to. No, 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 Chair, sorry. You no. Missed, um, item six, page five of your brief. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I jumped ahead of myself there. Uh, item six, sorry, item six on the agenda, a departmental briefing. Uh, COVID-19 financial support for Lockney uh, Fisheries. Um, I want to refer to the memo from uh, the, the clerk at page 39 to 40 and written by from the department at 41 to 44. Um, I want to welcome by, by Starleaf, Owen Little, Director for Marine and Fisheries, Damien McCann, Grade 7 Inland Fisheries Branch, and Seamus Connor, Head of Inland Fisheries Branch. Um, I'd like to invite Owen, uh, Damien and Seamus uh, to commence the briefing and then members will, will want to ask you some questions uh, thereafter. Um, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me, first of all, just checking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chair, I was quite uh, hopeful that you were going to just skip this agenda item, but, uh, <laughs> but I'll continue. So thank you very much for allowing us to appear here this morning and uh, to brief the committee on the proposed support package to provide um, short-term support to those Lochney inland fishermen who've been adversely impacted as a result of them not being able to fish during the COVID-19 pandemic. Pandemic. The department recognises the pressures faced by the Lochney fishing industry as a result of the COVID-19 uh, Outbreak, the commercial fishing industry has a very important role to play in the local economy and actually in the conservation and, and protection of fish stocks uh, in Loch Ney. Uh, Loch Ney is home to the largest wild eel fishery in Europe and is also home to several species of wild fresh, fresh, freshwater water fish, including pollen, dullahan, uh, and perch. Uh, traditional sustainable fishing methods are used on the loch, which have passed down for generations of fishermen. Uh, these fishermen play a critical role in preserving a way of life, protecting fish and safeguarding a viable commercial fishery. Inland fisheries officials have been working on designing a potential support scheme to provide short-term support to these inland fishermen who have been adversely impacted as a result of not being able to fish due to the COVID uh, pandemic. The aim of the funding package to alleviate, is to alleviate the financial impacts of the pandemic on commercial fishermen, licensed uh, or uh, on the Loch Ney. This could also include those uh, fishing for both eels and scale fish subject to meeting agreed eligibility criteria. The funding for this proposed scheme would be provided under Article 33, and that would be temporary cessation of fishing activities of the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund uh, programme. Loch Ney licensed fishermen that are best, our boat owners will be the beneficiaries of the scheme and not any organisation. The department continues to support the sectors of the fishing industry in Northern Ireland that have been most severely impacted by loss of markets as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. In total, up to £3.8 million pounds has been made available to support the industry during these challenging times. The proposed Loch Ney grant scheme payment would be equivalent of up to about 50% of an undertaking's uh, income forgone, or that's income lost, from the sale of fish during the six-month period, 1st of May 2020 to the 31st of October 2020, due to the pandemic. To avail of this funding, fishermen 
will have to cease fishing completely for periods of a month at a time and therefore will have had no income from fishing at all during the, the, those months that they're claiming for. The proposed scheme necessitates a cessation of fishing for periods of time to be eligible. Um, there has been, uh, you know, granted um, this the scheme was in, has been devised from about September and um, there has been delays in actually looking at their criteria and we have been uh, heavily engaged as officials with the Minister to and also looking at the um, conditions for the scheme and ensuring it uh, meets uh, EMFF uh, you know, requirements, etc., particularly for future audits. I'm glad to say that uh, those those aspects have now been considered and uh, the Minister's now uh, given approval for the scheme to progress. I'll bet that uh, prior to any announcement, there are some issues that still will probably have to be clarified by the Department of Finance. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, okay, I'm just right now. now th thank you uh, very much. Um, you know, it's, it's very long awaited, so it is, and uh, uh, incredibly long awaited, and I suppose it's welcome there's progress at this stage. Um, I'll bring Patsy in here. He's indicated he wants to ask a question. Patsy? Am I live yet? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Pat, we got you here. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks very much to the, the officials for attending. Um, I'm just looking at the time frame of this, and uh, I'm also looking at a minute of a meeting. Uh, I think Mr. O'Connor attended that meeting way back on the 29th of July last, which did refer to um, the criteria having been developed or nearly developed, and it made reference to the website application process about to go live. Now, that was back uh, last July, and the anticipation was that the process would be available and that people would be looking at the payments round about the autumn time. Now, I'm speaking, people are at the end of their tether with this. Um, I'm speaking to fishermen, um, I'm speaking to the co-op, and uh, people are really extremely frustrated at this. So what I'm trying to establish is, and I see there's been a lot of dilatoriness in responses back to the committee. Um, now, that was back in July, and the scheme was supposed to have been developed then. Um, the committee requested a further update on the 10th of September. That hadn't been received by the 26th of November. And by the 3rd of December, we got, to be honest with you guys, it was just a grandma and apple pie response. Um, nothing further. And, and I'm wondering what has taken place in that six months uh, to develop criteria. And also, if I could establish just, if we're at the stage of formulation of a project, or if, it's, uh, if that scheme has now come to conclusion, could you uh, clarify for me when that was submitted to the Department of Finance for approval? Because this is really, really, people have had no income from fishing for that period from May right through to October, nothing. And this was anticipated as a substitute income for it. And really, it is far from satisfactory. In fact, many people are saying, are we ever going to get paid anything we were laid, where we laid up the garden path? Well, to Chair, I'll, I'll come back. Uh, the this uh, this funding is coming from the EMFF, and um, we are there are not many uh, member states using the EMFF for COVID nineteen response, and Northern Ireland is the only uh, UK administration that has done so, and so therefore we have to be very uh, aware of accountability and regularity issues to ensure that any future audits and scrutiny by the Commission, uh, you know, that, that all the criteria are, are, have been properly looked at and made sure that requirements of managing public money and the EMFF regulations are, are, are being fully looked at. That has raised uh, some issues that have just required a more a detailed understanding before a decision has been, is able to be made by the Minister. Um, I'm not going to come here to uh, make excuses. These are just the, the reasons. Sometimes, and I think some of these uh, emergencies, what they do uncover is that when we're working uh, to normal circumstances, et cetera, some of these issues don't come to the fore, but in emergencies, it become heightened, and then the questions have to be asked. 
uh, you know, and there'll be lessons learned out of this about what we have to maybe take forward in, in future policy, et cetera, or we have to look at and develop for the future. Um, it, it, it has been, uh, you know, I can understand that and provides with those people who have not had, you know, the income. It's been torturous. I can tell you it's also been torturous for officials when, whenever you're dealing with a bureaucratic process. But I, I do believe that there's also responsibility that, you know, we ensure accountability and regularity and make sure that money spent well and that there's no sort of, uh, you know, afterburners to come back to, to hunt us and to hunt actually, uh, you know, not only the department, but also the stakeholders as well. Um, I mean, the, the department has, um, it, you know, I mentioned 3.8 million pound funds. It has issued a number of schemes throughout the year. Some of some of the other ones have had issues as well. Uh, you know, no less that the, um, you know, if we look at the four hundred thousand pound uh, Potter scheme, uh, no payments have been made yet, as we're still getting the legislation to deliver the support that's required. This has been an iterative process through the year under demand and circumstances, uh, and as I said, I emphasise uh, uh, at the, the 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 delays, but it has been for good reason, and officials have been working in the background to sort these issues out to make sure there is a good scheme when it actually does uh, launch. Yeah, I appreciate all that, but uh, seriously, folks, we're sitting here since uh, last July. This was referred to in, in some detail at a meeting with fishermen and that it was significantly developed at that stage. Could I ask just one, what questions had to be asked and of whom? Well, it was about um, who uh, the eligibility criteria, but who would actually be uh, covered by the scheme, and uh, we had to refer at times for legal advice uh, during that period. And you know, listen, the the real world is that uh, the people that we're leading on to get advice as economists and legal uh, legal people are actually stretched for other COVID schemes, other uh, Brexit and post transition issues, and uh, we. We've, we've had to go back and clarify a number of issues and just understand uh, what the sort of the ground truth is to actually make sure that the eligibility criteria is, 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 is will be fairly applied. So have those been entirely clarified to your satisfaction now? Well, the, 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 the have been um, Adequately briefed now and responses given to the minister, and the minister is now uh, made a, is making a decision uh, to progress the scheme. And uh, as I said, we just probably have to clarify a few bits from from that engagement uh, to make sure that that the minister can announce the scheme as soon as possible. Now, sorry, that, that wasn't really what I asked you. It was have those issues, those questions that you asked for clarity on, have they been clarified now? Well, they've been they've been uh, they've been. Well, listen. They've been clarified. As they've, they've, they've been the answers have been provided, and from that answers and advice, the minister has been able to make a decision. Right. So you're satisfied with the answers you've received back? Well, I, 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 I am satisfied that when we have engaged with people to provide answers, they have provided the detail and information that then judgment can be applied to if the scheme goes forward. Yes. Sorry, is that a yes? Are you satisfied with the answers you've received back? Well, I, I am satisfied with the information I have been provided. Yes, that has been allowed. That has been that has been provided. I, I mean, I I am not the person who ends up making the decision on a policy or the scheme to go forward. I have to uh, respond and pro provide the advice to the minister to ensure that he is fully informed. And I am content that the information has been supplied to the minister uh, at uh, when he has asked for clarifications or queries, or we have gone out and uh, had to clarify stuff. That information has now been provided. In total. Well, uh, well, nothing's well as far as we are concerned. Yes. Yes, that's okay. Now, then, where does the Department of Finance slot in? Well, this is more about this is more about the, um, and I'm just saying May because we just have to get clarification now. The decision's been made because this has been complex, and we need to make sure that this is within our our our, our remit as a department. I mean, this has just been normal recourse for a lot of novel schemes and issues to make sure the Department of Finance are engaged. So this is, I would, I would say from my experience, this is nothing special. This is just making sure that we follow the process and that there's no comeback. So, and the Department of Finance have been contacted about it and they've come back yet? No, they, they haven't because the decision has just been made recently by the minister and we're now, will be, will be discussions to progress that as quickly as possible.
Okay, and have you any time frame for a decision? I realise and respect that that's with the minister. Uh, have you any time frame for that? Because Owen, w with the greatest respect to the officials, and I'm sure you've been doing your bit, and I'm sure there are legal people trying to do their bit as well. But there are people who are trying to put a crust on the table here. I I, uh, I totally understand that, and I will be. You know, from the official side now, we've kind of got the direction. We will be pushing ahead as fast as possible. And I think, you know, if you look at our record during the year, once we've got decisions made and once we've clarified that uh, we have got the remit and, and uh, the varies and uh, we've got sound and valid accountability uh, procedures in place, we have progressed uh, at, at pace and across a number of schemes with very uh, limited resources. So I, 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 we will push this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair, I don't know, the other issue that had uh, to be raised was the issue of the Lochney fishermen. I don't know, what if you've been briefed on that or in a position to give any uh, issue about the, the complexities of the market with GB and those things. I don't know whether uh, I'd ask that that be flagged up with yourselves. If you can give us any insights into that, it's an issue that has become a pretty much a news item in the last couple of days, that's the, the inaccessibility of the GB market for uh, Lochney eels and subsequently the inability to get the glass um, eel or glass, glass the small the small eels to buy, purchase those from GB as well. Are you in a position to give us yes, any uh, no. um, Yes, I was informed that, uh, and, 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 and I was obviously aware with the, the current um, uh, media attention and also because this is one of our so top line uh, post transition issues so this is you know our, myself and officials are working in the background and uh, keeping the minister informed about this issue so um, th th this is one of the sort of um, I would say wrinkles from the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol um, effectively what it means is because of the, the status of the eels and the trade in eels underneath the the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of, um, you know, wild fauna and flora, that you know, the EU are quite strict that the trade in eels inside and outside the EU can't happen, and it has to go through their EU scientific review group. And um, the way that the, the protocol leaves us is that uh, actually, you know, if the glasses have full, 80% uh, of the trade has been secured uh, within uh, you know, the EU, uh, but it's the NIGB, uh, NIGB and GBNI that uh, falls outside the remit, which is significant at 20%. And also the knock-on effect of being able to restock with uh, the silver eels from the Severn. Um, we have been engaged very heavily with DEFRA. Uh, the minister has raised this issue at ministerial groups. Um, we, we uh, the, the, the situation is that the EU Scientific Review Group um, uh, did not accept the UK's non-detriment finding, and uh, you know, which is the, basically the uh, uh, yeah. scientific assessment, uh, and that will, and therefore the next. But they've indicated that uh, if this was uh, presented to them again, uh, that they, they they would look at it again. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen to the end of 21, and therefore, uh, as officials working with our DEFRA colleagues and the minister at ministerial level, uh, this has been, we're pushing this to try and make sure that. This can be addressed by other means. Um, I, I would, I'm, I, I'm not going to say I'm an expert in this area yet, uh, but, I say, um, but it's been a fascinating area. But I'm going to ask Seamus if he's anything to add, because I'm sure I've probably missed some of the detail. Uh, yes, on on thanks. Uh, I just want to just just to maybe indicate to the to, to the committee that listen, this uh, a negative opinion by the EU SRG group has been in place from uh, 2010. Um, eels were actually added to the Annex Two list of species on uh, under CITES in 2009, and this Annex Two listing essentially means that they are critically endangered, and we've seen the European eel collapse uh, as, by as much as maybe 90 or 95 percent. Which only leaves about five percent of what was there, you know, previously or historically, and I suppose that's some of the reason and rationale why there's such a great protection for eels. Um, whenever the UK left uh, the EU, uh, then uh, it was probably fairly clear at, at that stage, or uh, certainly it was clear to officials from a long way back, that this would have implications. Certainly, uh, depending on the outcome of the trade negotiations as to whether uh, Northern Ireland would have access or not access to the EU, and as Owen has already referred to, 80% of the trade in Loch Nails goes to the EU. So the Northern Ireland Protocol, in some respects, is, is helpful. 
and that it has secured that 80%, uh, but it obviously impacts in terms of the 20%, and, and, and that is where the difficulty lies. In terms of glass eels, uh, the stocking of eels to the Loch Ness is very important, very important to, to maintain that, that escapement that needs to happen from Loch Ness as part of our management plans. We need to ensure that 40% of that of um, of that uh, overall total of what would have been there, that pristine, pristine environment escapes, and we measure and monitor that every year to ensure that that does so. Uh, there are a few bumps probably further down the road in the sense that um, because the eel life, life cycle has such a long time, you're talking about probably 14 years for an adult eel, male eel and up to 20 years perhaps for a, an adult female before they leave the system. Uh, there is a considerable time lag between the crash that we saw in the 1990s and obviously we're actually seeing that uh, the, the drop in juvenile age coming back again uh, to, the, to, the, to the system now. Um, but we can secure uh, eels from the French fishery uh, and that can still go ahead and the Loch Ness has done so in the past. Uh, they are slightly earlier in the sense the fishery operates in around the kind of Ferby time which is slightly colder water uh, but certainly Loch Ness has received eels from the French in the, in the past and, and those eels have survived certainly the most recent batch I think last year uh, survived fairly well but obviously it is slightly dis disappointing that um, we cannot access uh, eels in GB uh, because of protocol. Um, the steps we have taken is we have got ICES, who are the international uh, experts, and provide a lot of advice to, to companies on a number of species, eels being included. Uh, we have sent that non detrimental finding that has been drafted up to allow the trade to continue, and they have raised uh, and given advice on a number of issues, and we're, we'll be dealing with those over the next uh, lot of months to try and answer those queries. And uh, I suppose the, the overall... Um, impact from the EU SRG group is that they don't deem that it's possible for a, a non detriment finding for the European eel as a whole because the eel, European eel stock is, is a single stock. It's what they call a pan mictic stock. So, therefore, eels in Germany or France or Northern Ireland or the south of Ireland are no different. And therefore, they have determined that this NDF must be done on the entire EU or European eel at that stock level. The NDF that we are proposing looks at a much smaller scale, but nonetheless, we have to ensure that we have all the necessary information in place uh, to actually provide that there. Uh, I should also point out that uh, to allow trade in eels, it requires an export permit by the person selling, but it also requires an import uh, permit by the people who are buying it as well, and each party must be, must be assured from their own scientific point of view. Over. Okay. Uh, thanks very much uh, for for both Seamus and uh, Owen there for the responses and thank you chair and other members of the committee for their forbearance and patience in that it's just this issue is such a, a crucial problem for so many people in Loch Ney. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patsy. Uh, Claire? Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks for the presentation. Can I just double check from own benefit? The the support that was offered to the, the sea fishermen was 80% of that initial budget EU funding as well? Um, uh, I don't know, Claire, I'm just, uh, I'll be honest, I'm doing the job and I wouldn't have that, that those figures uh, to hand. Um, certainly we're back next week. Uh, for a fisheries update and I can provide a clarification for the breakdown of that. Um, AMFF has been used for the support across uh, a number of schemes. Uh, I just need to check what the actual breakdown, if there's a breakdown. Okay, thanks. And then from that funding, am, am I right or wrong? Were the Loch Ney fishermen able to access any of that funding or have they received nothing to date? Um, th this is the, the scheme we've been talking about is a scheme to actually provide this funding uh, from the AMFF. Um, I'm not sure, Seamus, if you want to add anything because you would maybe have a bit more corporate knowledge from last year. Uh, no, I can, I, I can say, look, in terms of the, the specific scheme we have drafted up, uh, no, they, they haven't received any funding. But obviously, there are other COVID schemes available uh, for people who are out of work on that there as well. And it was, it's very important, obviously, from the, from the official's point of view, that, that there is no doubling up of, uh, of COVID assistance. So there may have been other, other schemes that uh, fishermen could uh, partake of because some of them will be, will be part-timers. Uh, and also, it's also uh, useful for the committee to note that, um, that not all fishermen start 
stop fishing. Uh, there were some fishermen that would have continued to fish on. I suppose the, the, the big issue for us was the fact that the market was so variable with the different companies taking different approaches and, and different timings, and therefore the demand was probably up and down. So uh, there was a desire to try and meet market demand by reducing the number of people who actually were fishing. But there would have been perhaps a number of other schemes that fishermen could have availed of over. Okay. So the date then they haven't been able to access the, the finances that were available for the sea fishing then. And I'm looking at and you've had on there we bit Seamus as well. I'm looking at the, the criteria here. So the criteria going to be used for the Loch Ness fishermen will be that they have to prove that they have lost income on a monthly basis. So that at a period that they're claiming for that that whole month that they couldn't that they were prevented from um fishing or that they had no income and i'm comparing that again to the sea fisheries as well so um you know that theirs was largely based on you know the, the, the income loss was sort of assessed according to the size of their ve um, vessels so i'm just wondering was there so if the Loch Ness fishermen are going to have to prove that they were unable to fish for a whole month, um, and some of them maybe have been out and fishing during a period, um, so if they were out, say, on the first, second and third of a month and not for the rest of the month, they'd not be able to claim for that month. Is that right? Uh, correct, correct, Claire. Yes, the, 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 this is a, a it's, it's it's due to the nature of the funding. It's about a cessation, so they have to stop for the entire month. It will be periods of month. Now, obviously, they can choose as to as to what, what months they stop for. Uh, I think the other differential between the sea fisher scheme was the first sea fisher scheme came along, uh, looked at those uh, fixed costs that would have would have affected them. So things like boat insurance, uh, birthing fees that still had to be paid on, uh, and that was why it wasn't suitable for the Loch Ness fishermen, their fees, they normally, they normally own the key. They, they, some of them maybe don't have insurance either. So it just wasn't, wasn't suitable at all because the, the cost would have been so low. So this scheme is very much bespoke for the Loch Ness fishermen. Uh, it's due to income that they obviously couldn't get, but it's uniquely tied in with the fact that uh, it's, it's, it's EMF funding and it's about that succession of fishing over. Okay, so the, I just want to ask, were the fishermen advised at the time that they would have to cease fishing entirely for the whole month in order to avail of any potential scheme? And was there official advice given from the department to them on any of that? We have we've had meetings with the Loch Ness Fishermen's Cooperative Society, and we've made it clear, certainly in our discussions with them, that uh, one of the key criteria for the for this there would be that they would have to stop for the entire month, and if they fished at all, uh, then then that would that would preclude them from getting claiming for that month. We also met with the Loch Ness Fishermen's Association, and we we give them also that that, that advice clearly as well over. And when when did that happen, Seamus? Um, we we met. Um, I think it was in July. We met the Loch Ness Fishermen's Association, and when we met the, the Loch Ness Fishermen's Corpus Society prior to that, there as well. Over. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Rosemary. Rosemary Barton. Rosemary. For a question. Can you hear me, yeah. Rosemary? Okay. Uh, uh, Chairman, I'm just wondering if you would give me a wee bit of latitude. Um, I want to ask about the Loch Erin eel fishermen. In relation to these eel fishermen were forced to cease fishing around 2010, and they never received any compensation for the loss of their livelihood. Um, is there anything now, looking back on that, can be done in relation to EEC funding? Um, Chair, I, I, I would have no details in that. That is a, a decade before me. Um, but certainly we can take that away and uh, uh, have a, get a response to that question. Yeah. Okay. Owen. Thank you. Okay, Rosemary. Um, uh, Morris? Morris? Yes. Yes, Chair. Uh, Chairman, I'm. Uh, um, uh, listen to to members, and it's been very well debated. And I'm happy that, despite the delay, there may be some conclusion to the matter. But if I, if I could digress uh, a little bit, chair, uh, and as concern the concern around the dropping uh, elvers and the rubber band system that are making its way to Lochney, 
I mean, I can remember uh, as a child, you know, but the cuts area of the band, where we had the, the rope sluices, uh, were, which were black uh, daily with eels uh, traveling up to Loch Ney. That no longer happens. So my question really, uh, if it can be answered, is with the reduced level of fishing on Loch Ney, what impact has ha that had on the stocks that's in the, rubber, in the, the loch at the minute? Uh, and also, every migratory species that comes into Loch Ney and its tributaries comes through the River Ban estuary here in Corian. What is the level of pollution from the Ban via Loch Ney? Is Loch Ney sustainable? Why, why, why are we having such a drop? Is it overfishing? Is it pollution? Or is it a combination of things? Well, uh, uh, start. Well, before, well, Chair, before uh, Seamus will have uh, again the, the longer term view in this. Um, I, I think, uh, to be honest, it's a, it's a combination. Um, as Seamus has alluded to, the life cycle of the species, particularly the eel, is, is quite long. Um, there has been heavy industrialization of our environment, particularly in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And I think uh, it's no individual factor. Uh, you know, um, there's probably been unsustainable fishing in the past across fisheries. Uh, there's been heightened pollution. There's been modification to waterways, which has, co which has created obstacles. Uh, there's been potentially dredging in certain areas, which has affected species. And I think all these have had an effect. And I think this is why uh, the sustainability, uh, you know, policies going forward are so important because we understand more about with the research that's been carried out by organizations like AFPE about you know what we now need to do and you know to be honest going forward if we are to sustain, sustain some of these stocks you know there might be there might have to be tougher decisions made in the future but I think as we have uh, gained that understanding and knowledge uh, then uh, it will allow us to to implement better policies to ensure that future generations actually can um, experience some of the experiences you've had. And I, listen, I, I, I was down at the ban as well when I was a youngster and, you know, I, I used to see salmon jumping all the time and uh, I used to see eels and when they cleared out shocks and flax dams close to the ban, you would have seen the odd good eel going out, you know, scooting out. So I think I, I think everybody would be love to see that sort of kind of restoration of our, our natural habitat to, to uh, a better quality. Seamus, have you maybe more detail on um, the specifics of that, that uh, uh, river course? Over the years, yes. On, uh, I mean, the ban, as as Morris has really rightly alluded to, the 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 normal run of glass eels uh, to the ban would have been around ten to twelve million. Um, that is that has dropped to somewhere between two and three million, and in some years it's it's actually much less. It may run to the hundreds of thousands rather than the millions. So that is a huge huge factor. But it's not just on the ban that we're seeing the the impact for eels. This is this is basically all over more or so. And as I said to you before, look, the the, the European eel population has dropped by as much as maybe ninety to ninety five percent, which is absolutely massive. Now, part of the reason behind that there probably has been uh, the the massive growth in terms of, of eel farms. And the problem with eels as a species is whereas we can take salmon and we can strip them and, and, and grow them, uh, we can take trout and do the same or rainbow trout, the life cycle of the eel has yet to be cracked fully and certainly fully on a commercial basis. So the only way people can get uh, eels for those farms is by taking from the wild. And it's that, I suppose, continuous take, uh, I suppose it's loss of habitat, it would be maybe the introduction of hydro dams as well, where eels and other migratory species can't get up or down and, and all these have had just have a significant impact and to a certain degree uh, uh, eels probably f uh, can survive better in water that is slightly polluted compared to the likes of salmon and uh, trout not there but that's probably the real differential that's why we have to as part of the eel management plans that are that are in place currently uh, all over Europe we have to demonstrate that there is a, a certain level of escapement from the ban uh, and from the Loch Ness system to ensure that we have adults that come back again uh, but because of that reduction, I mean, the scientific estimation is probably we should be looking at between seven and eight million glass eels per year. Uh, and, and you see already we're probably only, only reaching a third of that there, if we're lucky. And it does vary much from year to year. year, to year. And as Owen has said, look, that, that time lag is a huge factor because it's that crash in the 1990s uh, or that was saw in the 1990s that are, that are still starting to come through now. So we've seen small signs of hope where we get a slight increase 
But overall, uh, the number of glaciers coming back again uh, to many systems uh, in Europe is much less than it was historically. And I suppose that's the whole reason and rationale between uh, the trade being listed under Alex to Eucides and, and all the measures that are taking place and all the measures that are likely to take place in the future. And uh, I know within our own in management plan as we have provision in there that if we do not meet the escapement target that we may have to take further steps and that could mean a further reduction in the number of veils that can be taken from Loch Ney over. Mm -hmm. okay. One final question with your patience, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, Seamus had alluded to uh, importing oils from France and DB into Loch Ney. Is there any research, I know salmon have, a, have, a, have a, an unbuilt system they get back to the river they, they spawn in, is that the same with the eel? Have you got any evidence that the eel you're bringing in from France and uh, GB is actually returning to the ban, or is the life cycle of the eel so long that you haven't had a chance to, to record that yet? I think I think Morris one of the one of the big differences with with the eel uh, are are the gaps in the in the life cycle history. So these eels leave here and go to the Sargasso Sea. Now, no one unfortunately knows where they go to, where they spawn, and the difficulty we have is the homing instinct is not the same. So as far as barn fish will come back to the barn, you may get some strain, but primarily they'll come back again to the barn. The same is not true of eels, and mm. and, and that is the overall difficulty uh, that we're that we're faced with. There are many gaps, and although we put eels in and we have scientific evidence to from population data that would suggest that those eels survive when they leave here either as a, as a wild field of wild eel or a, an eel that was stocked from elsewhere we cannot with any definitive evidence say yes x percent they'll come back again or they don't come back or whatever and i suppose that's one of the big issues is are those gaps in the in the in the life history over listen thanks thanks very much Seamus, and thanks so on and chairman thanks for your patience yeah. Okay. William? Uh, I, I welcome the, the, the fact that there's going to be a support scheme, what, uh, albeit maybe it has taken some time to get them in place, but uh, there's no saying better late than never. The concern I would have, if I picked it up right, I'm right in saying that if a fisherman continued to fish, even though he was making a loss, if he didn't cease fishing, he may not be able to avail of this. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Uh, oh, and if I could, if I could maybe pick yeah. up on that oh. there, William. William, yes, that is that is unfortunate. That's those are the rules within the EMF scheme. Uh, those were agreed many years ago by the by the parties, and I say unfortunately we are bound by those rules and regulations. Over. Yeah, well, that, it could be important for some that maybe struggle through this to try and do their best, and then. Find that they fail foul by doing that, you know, that would be that would be an issue for me, you know. Absolutely, but uh, unfortunately, those uh, those rules and regulations are in place. We are bound to comply with those, and uh, you know, with its. Uh, if we didn't, then uh, an EU audit later on might pick up on them, and then the department would have to pay back money. So it's 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 unfortunate. Yeah, you're right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and hi. Hi. All right. Okay, that's me now, Chair, yeah. Good job, thank you. Um, I'd just like to say we welcome the support of this scheme, obviously, and I do support it. But with fishermen not as intensely fishing the lock at present, I'm just wondering how this will affect stocks and the habitat of the lock for the future and how this will then in turn affect fishing going forward. Thank you. Um, well, well, I'll start off and then I'll, I'll pass to Seamus. I, I think it's um, the, the simple answer is we, we don't know yet. And uh, I think there's been some with other environmental factors, there's been some sort of hope that we've had this uh, sort of bit of renaissance, uh, but actually some of the underlying factors haven't shown as maybe as big as improvement as, as we've hoped. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, if it's a station efficient, it will, it will have some some benefit is whether that benefit gets sustained and I'm not sure uh, Seamus if you know, what uh, research has been done or, or has been able to be, do, to be done because of the pandemic but have you anything to add? 
Yes, well, I, mean, I mean, basically, look, I, I mentioned before about the escape and target, and one of the concerns we had as a, as a department was that uh, with, a product, with, a, with a model we have for looking at um, the take from the fishery and the number that are likely to escape, there was a concern that over the next few years that we would fail to meet that escape and target. Uh, to some degree, the reduction of fishing has been a benefit. I think it, it, it will probably show that, that we have uh, eased that burden slightly. Uh, uh, I suppose it's not possible to say fully because all the data is not in yet, but but I would suggest that that's probably beneficial in that slightly longer term and that it certainly eases that escape and bargain uh, or burden hopefully over the next few years over. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And uh, just to conclude, I want to thank Owen, Damien and Seamus uh, for, for your briefing. That was very comprehensive and very comprehensive uh, answers to all of the questions that was raised by the members. So, again, um, thank you very much for coming on this morning. Uh, okay. thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, okay, members, uh, we're going to move on now to item seven on the uh, agenda. It's an oral briefing, an oral briefing on the independent panel for review of, of decisions. I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 47, uh, papers from the department at page uh, 52, uh, a raised paper at page 64, and correspondence from the Agricultural Consultant Association at pages 80 to 87, and NIAPA at page 88 of your packs. Okay. And, okay. and at this juncture, then, I'd like to uh, welcome by Starleaf, uh, Jason Foy, uh, the uh, Jason Foy, the uh, area-based schemes organisational development, uh, George Kerr, area-based schemes operational policy branch, Trees O'Neill, area-based schemes delivery unit, and John McGrath, area-based schemes payment branch. And I would like to uh, invite the uh, officials to commence a briefing and then members will uh, be able to ask some questions uh, thereafter. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can I just check you can hear me? Yeah, is all okay. the other members okay as well? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, opportunity for my colleagues and I to provide briefing to the committee uh, on, review, on the review of decisions process and in particular on the independent panel stage. Members will be aware from the, uh, the committee will be aware from the uh, briefing that the uh, department has operated a statutory based review process for a succession of area based schemes since 2001. Its aim has been to provide farmers with an impartial and transparent review of scheme decisions against the framework of EU and national regulations and scheme rules. The scope of the process is limited to area based schemes only and only to farm businesses which have applied to these schemes. Where a farmer uh, believes that the department's original decision in connection with the scheme uh, has been incorrect, this process is intended to afford the opportunity for redress and the chance to pre present any pertinent additional information. The process is also important for us in terms of good governance. Uh, it, in, it aims to ensure that if errors or procedural shortcomings are discovered, these can be addressed and avoided so that in future farmers will not uh, farmers in the same position will not need to have recourse to the review process and we've invested considerable time and resource uh, over uh, a long period of time in the review of decisions process the role of the independent panel uh, is set out in legislation and the department has provided uh, we've provided some background information on that in the written briefing the department remains the decision-making body and cannot currently delegate the final decision to a third party. As a paying agency for EU and national funds, the department has a responsibility to ensure that these funds are appropriately administered and that they're within the scope of the scheme rules and legislation. Where the department receives a recommendation from the independent panel, we treat it very seriously and give it thorough consideration at all times and in every case. Panel recommendations are not rejected lightly or without good reason. We endeavour at all times to provide to farmers a high standard of customer service, including clear and effective communication with applicants in the review of decision process. 
When the final decision issues following a panel assessment, the department has always informed the applicant in writing of both the panel's recommendation and the rationale behind its own final position, whether that is to accept or reject that panel recommendation. And where the panel recommendation has been rejected, our letter uh, includes the specific reasons for that rejection. I would like to reassure the committee that the cost of a claim has never been a factor in not accepting a panel recommendation. Since the schemes are already fully funded, there is uh, funding available to make payment against claims, against all claims deemed eligible. The department has only uh, determined that panel recommendations can't be accepted where this has been necessary, where this has been imperative. Within the written briefing we've provided um, at Annex A in our briefing, uh, we have provided the rationale for rejecting panel recommendations in the 35 such cases that there have been in the last three years. And we have disclosed as much detail as we consider possible whilst uh, maintaining um, the confidentiality of the process and not revealing details of individual cases unnecessarily. Qualitative evidence in terms of uh, applicants' feedback in the process that we've been running for the last three years has been positive. Uh, we welc uh, there's been a welcoming level of engagement uh, from, from us, uh, indicating whilst some farmers have been disappointed with the final outcome, um, there's certainly a recognition that there's greater, greater clarity as to how and why decisions have been reached. The reduced number of applicants going to the panel stage uh, to us seems to bear that out and that we're providing more information at the initial case stage where the applicant can more fully understand the decision that's been made. Annually, and there's an average of 24 second stage applications that we've received since 1st of April 2018. And under the old process, the average figure, uh, average annual figure was 138. The final decision letter uh, follows panel assessment and also informs applicants of their options. If an applicant believes that DARE has not correctly adhered to procedures, they may refer to uh, a complaint to the NI Public Service Ombudsman. And judicial review is the route by which they may challenge the decision on a point of law. The committee will be aware that the minister has instructed that the independent panel should make the final decision in cases referred to it as opposed to a recommendation and we're currently taking forward some work uh, to put that into effect uh, which will require new legislation to be laid and it's intended that that will be brought into effect later this year. I'd just like to conclude uh, Chairman my uh, opening statement um, by reassuring the committee that uh, under the review of decisions process we administer for area-based schemes our primary focus is to ensure that farm businesses are given every opportunity to present their case and we strive to ensure that the correct decision is reached in line with the schemes legislation and where the decision reached is not in the applicant's favour that a detailed explanation for that is provided. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my opening statement. Um, thank you, thank you for that, uh, Jason, um, for, that, for that briefing. And um, I have a number of members who want to ask some questions of you. Um, I suppose before I go any further, that um, I will say that for farmers involved in this process, uh, it's a very frustrating one, uh, particularly in situations when they get to the independent review who find in their favour and then the department doesn't take on board that finding. It's a very frustrating and demoralising process and it leaves many farmers wondering, well, what, what, why, why go through with, 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 this, with this at all, you know? And at that juncture for, for many farmers, it feels like, uh, you know, they're faced with a choice of either uh, taking a judicial review, but in most cases, farmers just walk away, and and it's and it's it's very very demoralising, and um, and I think that I suppose um, like many MLAs have been involved in these um, situations dealing with constituents, um, and I suppose what when I reflect it across to another an, another sort of department area, you know, you know, in the case of for example, you know, you know, I've been involved in these. Uh, independent review situations 
uh, in the cases of maybe school placement, you know, and in those situations within education, for example, the, you know, the department, uh, you know, was, was obliged to to withhold or to uh, take take on board as a legally binding uh, the, the decision of uh, of tribunal in those that situation, and if successful, you know, a school would be obliged to take on board that decision offer a place to change. So, you know, again, I know it's a different it's a different um, area, but it's the same model and at the, and. At so farmers find it very frustrating if they if they get the decision that they want with the Department of the Board. And sometimes they feel like it's almost like a David and Goliath scenario where, where they have very little recourse other than to 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 go home and accept their loss. And it's very frustrating. Um, but I will I will say that the minister is uh, on record as saying that he uh, he gave a commitment to uphold the decisions of the independent review panel. Um, you know, so seeing that situation, will, will, will that be legislative for, you know, is, will he be able to see that through? We believe so. Certainly our um, intention is that um, new regulations uh, to give effect to that will be brought forward later this later this year. So we do believe that is um that is certainly possible. The minister has been very clear in his view, and we have a clear direction um, in terms of how we're going to bring that about through br the bringing forward of, of new regulations to uh, give that role to the panel uh, and put that um, on a on a proper statutory footing. So just just to be clear before we move around, then, yeah. so the decisions of the independent panel would there become legally binding and the department would be obliged then to take on board the view of the independent panel? The panel uh, effectively would be making the decision mm -hmm. um, and we would then be implementing whatever that decision would be. Um, mm -hmm. So a uh, short answer is yes, uh, that's, that's what the regulations would in effect, uh, new regulations would in effect do, mm -hmm. would be to uh, have the panel um, not necessarily making a recommendation anymore, but having a decision-making rule, a formal decision-making rule in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I'm just going to move around the room here. Uh, Harry? Harry? Okay, I'll be ready to go now. Yeah, we can hear you, Harry. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, this question touches on some case-specific issues, and I can appreciate if you're unable to fully answer it. However, in terms of the interest payment to those cases that have previously been the subject of a JR, I'm aware that there's no legal requirement for such a payment, and that any award in the past has been ex gratia. There appears to be differences in the amount awarded previously, how are such figures arrived at and who makes such a decision? Thank you. Okay, uh, Chairman, the, the decision ultimately on an extra issue payment um, is the Departmental Accounting Officer or the Permanent Secretary. Ultimately has, has the decision uh, making role for extra issue payments. Um, as you've noted, the, there is no requirement, there's no legal requirement for us to, for the department to pay interest on payments that are, are refunded. In cases where uh, there is some justification for it, and I must stress in this uh, that each case is treated on, on its own merits, um, where that is the case, the standard that we have used is the same standard that we apply to any debts that are recoverable from foreign businesses to the department, which is the Bank of England based rate plus 1%. Um, we believe that is a, a, a fair um, standard. It is, a, it is a set and transparent standard um, and one which takes account of uh, prevailing economic circumstances. So it's not a fixed rate in the sense it's the Bank of England based plus 1%. Uh, and so that's what we apply uh, where uh, in those cases where uh, we consider that interest is, is payable. Any ex gratia payment, uh, both its amount uh, and, and whether it's payable or not, uh, and those considerations were guided very much by managing public money, Northern Ireland, um, and uh, the department, and obviously the, the accounting officer uh, are bound by, uh, bound by that. Okay. And tell me, what lessons have been learned by the department in terms of JR judgments? Okay. 
Well, um, without going into specific uh, cases, um, as I'm sure the committee appreciate, we, we, we do uh, very much seek to learn lessons from, from judicial review um, uh, cases uh, and the judgments that are, are laid down by uh, the judges in those cases. So to take one example, where there is a, a case um, where there has been a case recently that the committee will be aware of, where the judge uh, level some criticisms uh, against the department that we we didn't fully explain our our decisions properly to the applicant and didn't engage uh, sufficiently with the core issues raised by the panel. Um, we have certainly taken that on board and are endeavouring to provide more information and more detailed explanation and more direct explanation to applicants in in future cases. There certainly has been um, another case that the committee uh, will be aware of where there were criticisms uh, made um, or shortcomings found in, in, uh, in, in our application of um, the standard around um, uh, negligent and intentional uh, penalties and some shortcomings in record keeping uh, during inspections and those have certainly been addressed um in in recent uh, in recent years but it, as i say each case is is very individual and so in some cases uh, there are not many cases um but in some cases the um circumstances are very unique and whatever lessons we can take from that and, and apply to other cases we certainly do but it wouldn't necessarily apply to everyone that a rule is changed for for every single case because again each case is treated on its own merits and just to finish, maybe, Chair, if I could, how many panel recommendations have ministers in the past agreed with against the recommendations of the department officials? Uh, I'm not aware of, of a figure um, on, on that. Um, uh, unfortunately, where, um, where the department has had the decision-making role, um, there has been no requirement then to seek a minister's opinion uh, on that. The statutory basis is that the department makes a decision and the process ends there. We don't then seek the minister's opinion on, on individual cases. So I'm afraid we don't have a record of, of what the minister's opinion may have been in the past on an individual case. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Ed, hi. Um, William? William? Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, William. Okay, Jason, thank you for your presentation. Um, Jason, um, as many other MLAs, I've been involved in independent panels, uh, meetings with, with farmers, and was very frustrated when um, the department didn't accept the findings of some of those independent panels, and I think. Uh, it was very demoralizing for the farmers involved. And I had one particular farmer, he just threw his hands up and said, what's the point, you know? So uh, a re relatively small farmer and a young farmer, actually. But I'll say this, uh, I want to ask the question in relation to, uh, and I welcome the fact that there are moves uh, to legislate and uh, make the independent panel a final adjudication the final decision. I think that's good, uh, Jason. I, I welcome that fact. Uh, but I'm aware by press reports that there are a number sitting with the department at the moment of independent where independent pounds have adjudicated in favour of the farmer, but the department's still not making a decision on those. What's the reason for that, given the minister's current position on this? Well, uh our position um, at, up to this point has uh, been, and I think may continue to be, that we, we need to examine the panel's um, uh, recommendations, because at, at this point there are still recommendations, uh, to ensure that they are in keeping with uh, the law as written and regulations that still uh, apply uh, to schemes and scheme rules. So where we have uh, received recommendations, certainly in and it's, uh, we, we've um, indicated this at, at Annex A in, in the written briefing. Uh, where we have had cases going to panel in the last three years, we have um, accepted um, 
where the panel has, has recommended that the uh, decision be changed, uh, we have we have accepted that. Um, uh, as you'll see in the last page of our briefing in 11 cases, partially accepted it in, in one case, and then we have eight still under consideration. Um, because they are un under consideration, I don't want the panel to form the uh, the impression that we're necessarily going to reject those those recommendations. That 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 is not the case. Um, we are considering uh, we consider each case very carefully, and uh, we just need to ensure that there uh, that the recommendation is in keeping with uh, the regulations that govern the schemes. Okay. Um, would you accept, and I, I don't want to put you in the spot that the department obviously hasn't got it right all the time because there has been a couple of judicial reviews where the department has lost the case. So in effect, that being the case, it would in effect say that the department hasn't got it right in the time past. Yeah, and, and I would fully accept that. There are cases where the department, where we do get it wrong. Um, uh, um, certainly, we, we try and minimize the number of, of instances where that happens. But, um, you know, this is a process um, that we operate, um, and we've operated, uh, as we've said in the briefing, for 20 years, um, to offer farmers um, redress. If we were perfect, uh, that process wouldn't be necessary, but it is necessary because um, there are instances where we do, where, mis where administrative mistakes are, are made or where the farmer presents further information through the review process that does change our view of the case uh, and new facts are introduced that weren't uh, available to us at the time. And you know, where the facts change, we change our, we change our opinion. That can happen, and there are, are some instances to conclude where, yeah, we, we do we do get it wrong, and um, I have certainly no difficulty in in admitting and recognizing that, but also saying that the challenge for us is learning from that, and ensuring that we take those decisions and then apply the lessons learned to to future cases. Well, it's just it's so important that uh, when the department gets it wrong, it, it can be very expensive for everyone, and I, I do think. There, there is, of course, a judgment call in many of these to be made, but my view has always been if the, if the, the thing is quite close, the department should be falling on the side of the farmer instead of not doing that. I mean, there are there are judgment calls to be made in, in, on some of these issues, um, but obviously ones that has been lost at GR has proven that a judge took the same view as the independent panel and... and uh, well, in, in, a, in, a, in a couple of judicial review cases, the, the, the judgment has been, has been quite careful around the matter. The, the decision has been remitted back to the department to retake. Uh, it hasn't necessarily been the case that the uh, presiding judge has said um, straight away that the department had made the wrong decision. Um, there have been shortcomings identified in process and the department has then been asked to retake it. And um, that is what we have, have done. Um, in those cases, uh, and we do seek to seek to learn from from those. Um, certainly, the department has no desire to um, be involved in the judicial review process any any more than a than yeah. the, the applicant farmer. Um, well, listen, we, we do seek to apply those rules um, in the best way that we can. Thank you. Okay, um, Rosemary. Rosemary. Rosemary, you're fr you're freezing. Yeah, I can see you, but I can't hear you, Rosemary. Are you on mute or something, maybe? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, Rosemary. Thank you. Um, just to say that I welcome this new review process, and hopefully it'll be it'll uh, gain the confidence of the of the people that are taking their the appeals, etc. But what I want to ask is, is is this new this new process, review process, is it likely to are there any plans to review any of the older cases that have taken place? Uh, not at present, but it is an issue that uh, that we're aware of, um, and certainly is something we'll be considering um, as we bring forward the legislation uh, to implement the new process. Right, and um, 
So you, you, there is a possibility that it may eventually look at the older older cases. Um, I, I honestly could not say, uh, Ms. Barton. It's 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 an issue. I don't want to certainly you know lead the committee one way or the other on this because I I generally don't know the answers to that question. But it is a question that we we are aware of, um, and will. Um, have to uh, resolve one way or the other um, as the new legislation is brought forward. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know the answer uh, in short. Okay, thank you. Can can you tell me over the year, over the 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 past number of years that your process has been that this present process that you have has been in place for appeals? What other are there any other countries within um, within the United Kingdom that have had the same process? Uh, all four uh, devolved administrations um, do have um, uh, review uh, processes. Uh, so there are there are different processes in in England, Scotland, and Wales, um, and in uh, and in the Republic of Ireland as well. And I think it's probably common across, fairly common across, um, uh, certainly when we were in the EU across EU member states, that the a process exists in one form or another. Yes. Right. And these these processes where was the Department of Agriculture, what were their thoughts? Did they listen did they take on board what the independent panel suggested or did it fall back to the department? In in the case of um in the in the case of uh, Scotland, uh, for for example, there is a, a a judicial process involved in appeal to the Scottish Land Court. Uh, so there's a, obviously given the, the separate Scottish legal system, there is a, a separate legal process uh, in Scotland um, uh, on, under a different different framework. In, in Wales, there's a, a panel review, rather like rather like ours, um, and a recommendation is made by that panel uh, to the minister. Who makes a final decision, and that is also the case in England uh, as well, where there's a panel who make a recommendation to to a minister who makes the final decision. Okay, thank you. And um, have you any idea from say 2016 the percentage of uh, cases that have been taken to independent panel reviews that the recommendation that independent panel has made differs from that of the department? At the initial decision stage or, or, or subsequent to the panel? At the, at the subsequent to the panel, at, at, the initial, at the independent panel review stage. Right. Well, in, in the last uh, table of, of Annex A of our briefing, uh, our written briefing documents to the committee, we have set out um, the position over the last three years where yeah. there have been 44 panel assessments completed. Um, in uh, 24 of those, um, the panel has not upheld the um, uh, the review for the farmer. So there are only 20 cases out of the 44 yeah. where um, the panel has recommended that we accept uh, that we changed the decision. Um, we've accepted those uh, in 11 cases. We've accepted that in 11 cases. We have partially accepted it in one case, and then the remaining eight are still under consideration. Yeah. And those are the cases I referred to earlier. Yeah, OK. And last question, yeah. when do you expect this new appeals process likely to be in place? Well, we aim to have this in place by the end of this year. Uh, there will obviously be a consultation um, and a process with uh, of engagement with the committee again to bring forward the legislation for scrutiny. Um, but we we intend to bring this forward by the end of by the end of this year. Okay. Thank Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, Jason uh, Patsy. Thanks very much, Chair, and um, Jason, good to see you again, and just thank you and, and your staff there for all the help and assistance that you have been previously with different cases. Um, You're welcome. What, what I'm asking is just, that's maybe tying down the detail a wee bit more on a point that Rosemary referred to there. Um, you mentioned that there were eight cases uh, where the department had, um, well, maybe describe it as sought to differ with the decision of the, the independent review mechanism or panel. So <clears throat> the question that I'm asking is one is, will those eight cases be held 
until such times as the legislation, new legislation that you're bringing in will decide upon them. And that in itself then would probably create um, an issue as well for any other previous cases prior to that. In other words, is there going to be a retrospective cutoff point for cases uh, in which this, uh, this new legislation where the decision of the panel would be binding upon the department? Mm. Well, uh, I'd, I'd have to say, um, to begin with, on the, on the eight cases, we, we don't necessarily differ with the, with the panel. We are looking at their recommendations in, in detail, and those cases will progress um, right. as normal. So mm -hmm. I don't think, um, I, I don't want the committee to um, uh, necessarily take the view that we're, we're going to reject the panel recommendations in those cases. Um, we, we are not. Those, those are, th that, that's our active caseload at the moment uh, that we're working through cases will be cleared, more cases will be added as panels continue to sit. So we'd always have a number there that we've got sitting at any any given point. As far as uh, retrospection is, is, is concerned, um, I, I must refer back to the, the answer I gave earlier around um, it is an issue that we are we'll be considering in the context of, of new um, legislation to bring about a new, a new system. And um, I'm, I'm very keenly aware that there will be, as we switch over to a, a, a new um, regime, that there will be cases that are in train at that point in time, and we will have to make a call um, and clarify that in legislation, uh, one way or the other, how those cases are, 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 to, be, are, are to be treated in terms of that they, they may be in, you know, at the panel, there may be post-panel at the time new legislation comes into effect. So we'll we'll seek to try and and transition that um, in a in a, a, a as practical a way as we can. But I'm 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 quite mindful um, of um, uh, maybe unintended consequences where you know a a farmer might miss miss that <laughs> that effective date by a day or a week, and you know there would be a perception of unfairness um, there. So it's it's something we'll have to treat um, and think through properly and carefully to ensure that we treat uh, farmers in, in an equitable fashion. Okay, thanks for that, Jason. Thank you, Patsy and Jason. Uh, John, John Blair. Uh, Chair, yeah, th thank you, and uh, thank you, Jason, and, and your colleagues also for being, being with us today. Uh, questions, Jason, uh, I have are mainly around the, the governance and accountability of the structure, so I'm going to try and roll a, a number of points into one here. It's clear that the current panel was first appointed in 2012, uh, reinstated in, in 2015, and then extended again. In 2018. So I wonder could you give us a bit for, for some of us who, who weren't around prior to 2018 uh, in the assembly, could you give us a bit more information on how the panel was currently uh, recruited or appointed, uh, how vacancies that arise are filled, and also given that you've indicated in your report that the, the current extension is until January 2021, uh, how any gap will be filled between January 21, and we're, we're now almost in February, and the um, uh, process being finalised for, for new regulations to come into place, and again, wh when that might be. And also, and, and for me, very importantly, um, if, if the Minister is directing that, that the uh, panel should now take the final decision, um, and I don't have any particular issues with that in itself, by the way, uh, is there a plan in the regulations that are being formulated now for the future that the panel would be appointed by public appointment? It's been indicated uh, in the report today that the, the current panel was not appointed by the public appointment process, and surely that would be crucial if people were going to make a, a final decision. Yes, thank you. I mean, that, that, is, a, that is a very... Um... Uh, is a very fair point, uh, and it's something we've we've um, we've thought about uh, in terms of um, the status of the panel as far as a public appointment is concerned. Whilst um, the panel, as they were recruited um, in the past, were not uh, were not formal public appointments, uh, public appointments uh, with appointments made formally under the code, um, we did seek to mirror uh, as much as we could the public appointment process. Uh, it's something we will have to consider and take um, probably take some specialist advice on where we have a panel that has a formal decision-making role. Um, 
does that make should that make the uh, panel members formal public appointments uh, fully fledged under under the code and if that's if that's the case then that's what we will do um, the panel, uh, as you've known, have, have, we've got a pool of panels, so, of, of panel members. So uh, a panel, um, I think we have from, uh, from memory around 17 uh, panel members uh, to draw from, and we use them to, uh, we use them to form uh, panels of two or three um, to hear cases on, on a day. So we have multiple panels going um, at, at different times, depending on, on demand. So the um, appointment process, uh, as you've indicated, has been has been going on for for uh, had been completed a number of years ago. Um, through different circumstances and changes in the process, we've extended them them out. Um, but I think we have now reached a point where we had reached a point, certainly uh, even before the minister's um, decision on the status of the panel, that we would seek to recruit a new panel. So what we're going to try and do is um, uh, is try and do the, uh, the two exercises simultaneously. So we will have a new panel, a uh, set of panel members appointed at the point that we'll try and uh, make sure this coincides as much as we can where the new panel uh, is recruited at the same time that the status of the panel itself changes and becomes a decision-making um, body. So uh, it's 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 very much uh, I think our, our view that we will have a similar uh, requirement for panel members that we will require multiple panel members who will then be who work in a similar way hearing cases on a particular day um, and uh, setting as a panel to hear multiple cases. Okay, Jason. Thank you. Just just to clarify, given that the um, alluded to deadline of January twenty one for for the. Uh, expiry of the current panel um, is almost at the uh, expiry point. I'm assuming that the current panel system is going to have to roll on until those new regulations are in place. And is there a process required to extend that again? Or is that simply a policy yeah. scheme? I, I think they have. I think we are going to extend them until uh, until the end of this and um, the end of this year, if we haven't already uh, done so. Um, I'll just draw in uh, my colleague, Gregor Kerr here, who can clarify that point yeah but the panel has actually been extended to january 22 um that that decision has already been taken and that's the the uh so the the, the panel has been extended for this year okay okay but, uh, but as you say, the, the existing panel and the um, uh, structures around that will continue because we will want to continue to process cases and hear cases uh, through this year. Okay, look, so thank you for that. But I'm, I'm mindful, if you don't mind me reflecting, that that's a fairly tight deadline uh, if there is to be a legislative process required. And on top of that, um, a decision to be made, first of all, on whether or not there's going to be a public appointments process and then to have to go through that public appointments process, so yeah. we could probably be looking at a further extension if required. Is that right? It's something we would seek to to avoid if we can. Um, I mean, certainly we're very keenly aware. Um, I can assure the committee we're very keenly aware of the timetable involved here and how how ambitious that that is. Um, and so, if a further extension is required, um, we we can we can do that. But um, it's something we would seek to avoid given the length of time that the existing panel has has been there, uh, and we would like to to try and have a as clean a start. Um, with with a new process as we possibly can. Okay, look, thank you both for that. Okay, thank you, John Clare. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Jason and the team for being with us today. Um, I know we all know that the, the independent panel's decision isn't binding, um, but we do know also that the department must ensure that its final decision adheres to all relevant legislation and scheme rules. Um, so I'm wondering, um, will this still remain the same going forward? Because um, I'm just thinking we're out of the EU now as well. So will this remain the same for in cases where the environmental performance scheme or the EU funded or even basic payment schemes prior to 2020 scheme year applies? 
Yes, you're quite correct. Those, those regulations will continue to apply. So even with a new panel in, pay, in place with a with a decision making role, um, the certainly for the environmental farming scheme, which is is fully uh, under EU regulations, those regulations will continue, um, and we must ad adhere to them. Uh, for national uh, funded schemes like the basic payment for 2020 and beyond, um, the uh, EU regulations have in large part been just translated uh, and, and brought across into UK law um, and I know the Minister has separately announced some, some amendments and changes that he's going to make, he wants to make for 2021 but those regulations and, and uh, statute rules, whatever they happen to be, still apply and as a department um, we are keen to ensure that whatever decisions either the department would have made in the past or a panel may make in the future are are legal and and in keeping with those regulations that thank will not change you. yeah thanks and we know that the similar process has happened through all regions in the uk so i'm looking yeah. at some of the statistics here so in northern ireland um is it 40 percent of decisions um are either changed in part or full um in the independent panel stage so is that the independent panel um in 40% of the cases differ from the department's decision. Yes. yes. And that's comparable to only 2% in Wales, for example. Is there any rationale from the department about why there's such a disparity in those figures? Well, the um, th those are, are um, the figures. Um, I don't think fully reflect the fact that um, the applicant populations are different in uh, in Northern Ireland and and in Wales. For example, we have many more farmers. Uh, we've got a higher volume of cases than uh, than perhaps would be expected in Wales. The schemes are different in in in, in some cases. The rules are different. There are variations in rules, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there are um, and farming practices are different. Uh, et cetera. So there's a number. There's a complicated um, array of factors that play into why we would have um, cases, uh, why we would have a particular volume of cases compared to uh, to other UK jurisdictions. Um, I don't think there's any single factor that you could put your finger on and say, that's why we have uh, that number and why Wales has as, 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 a, as a lower number in terms of the, uh, the decisions that um, or the recommendations that the panels make. Certainly, um, I think we can see, I don't know how this compares to other UK jurisdictions, but we would certainly see at review of decision uh, process, even at the first stage as well, a significant proportion of cases where farmers are introducing new facts and new information yeah. at the panel stage. And I think that may be a factor um, in, in why uh, the figures for Northern Ireland are the way they are. Okay, no, that's grand. But then I just want to ask you, are you confident then that the, the department's final decisions made adhere to all the relevant legislation that you have to comply with? Yes, I think we're as confident as, as, as we can be around around the need to uh, comply with with the, the the regulations. And for EFS, as I've said, that is fully under UK under EU regulations and will will be for a few years yet. The uh, basic payment, um, uh, the rules, and the the regulations that. Um, pertain to it originated in the in the EU and as the committee will be aware EU rules are very very prescriptive indeed uh, with very little room for ambiguity so there are there are more um, there are more rules and stricter rules for these schemes that we would have to adhere to and that's what we're very careful to uh, to ensure that we do to avoid the risk of any um, financial correction or financial disallowance from the commission uh, yeah. which would have to be which could be significant and would have to be met um by the department uh by the the, the uk taxpayer so that's something we're very mindful of our responsibilities in that regard and something we seek to avoid okay and back in april 2018 dira moved then to um trying to get a new single stage um process there and to remove the independent panel um, and we know then that the UFU filed a judicial review in that case and the department then um, re um, reversed its, its, its move there to, to remove the independent panel. What was the rationale for the department wanting to do that? 
That was um, the uh, review of the review of decisions process at that time was instigated um, at the request of the of the minister at the time, um, and the rationale for that was um, a fairly high degree of dissatisfaction with the length of time the process was taking and the length of time it was taking for uh, cases to get right the way through from initial decision through first stage appeal and through panel um, and the uh, minister had asked for a more streamlined process and one which would render decisions to farmers more quickly and after a process of, cons of public consultation and stakeholder consultation um, we had um well this was the decision was taken then to implement a single stage process um when the um assembly was not sitting and ministers were not in place so the process was commenced by the minister at the time and the um single stage process was then implemented um by the department afterwards okay so back in when we did have a minister until tw january 2017 that would have been part of their instruction at that time yes. to remove the independent panel not necessarily specifically to remove the independent panel um i don't think the, the minister's instructions were were as prescriptive as as that it was to review the process um in its entirety and um develop a process which was uh more responsive, um, that the farmer um, had more engagement and involvement with, um, but was also faster in terms of giving final decisions back to farmers. Okay, then, so the following year, it was officials' decision then to try and remove the independent panel at that time, according to that strategy from the previous minister when the assembly was down? It was, it was essentially to try and um, Streamline. improve the first stage process um, and uh, essentially combine elements of, of, of both parts of, of the process into, into a single stage. That was the objective. Okay. And as I'm going to follow on from the um, questions um, raised there with, by John Blair and, and in terms of the appointment of the panel members. And obviously this current um, panel membership has been there for quite a long time. So what experiences or expertise is needed for an appointment to the panel? Um, for example, if we have to be very, if, if you're, if, if the department's final decision has to be legally compliant, um, is there a remit to have um, members on the panel with a legal background? There's no requirement. Uh, yeah, there's no requirement at present for panel members to have um, a legal background. Um, there are some panel members who do, but it's they don't. They're not required to have. And uh, following on um, from Mr. Blair's question, um, that is something we'll have to consider in terms of what we will require in terms of experience and aptitude uh, and qualifications for panel members. Um, in the future where they are, where they have a final decision making role it may not necessarily be the case that um we will say i mean we, we cannot say at this point that they will we, they will have to have legal qualifications but it's a it's an issue we'll have to think about um in terms of the constitution of a new panel okay and is this a paid or a voluntary post for panel members? Uh, there is uh, there is uh, there is a daily payment uh, involved uh, for their time and also for uh, travel and subsistence expenses. Okay, and then just finally then with this new process that is being looked at by the department, um, is it likely that we will be looking at a very different process um, in the future? Or, and just I'm thinking obviously then um, we are now outside the EU, but within the limitations of the protocol. Um, so is there much flexibility for a very different process to be Put forward. Um, I think what we're what we're looking at um, in the context of a new process will still be a two stage process. So we will. I don't think we're we're intending to um, do anything to the first stage. I think what we're looking to do is still have two stages. We would still have a panel, but the panel would um, uh, have that final decision making role. So I think the change. Is, is going to be limited to to that uh, at present. Um, I'm not aware of um, uh, any suggestions made by stakeholders um, or anyone else to move to a completely different system again. Um, although we'd 
um, that's something the minister may choose to to consider, but um, that's not formed the basis of, of his instructions to us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Tara. Thank you, Peter. Okay, um, we've got here now, we've got Morris, last speaker. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much to Jason, Teresa, and John for taking the time to appear before the committee today. Uh, Chairman, I, I would welcome uh, the review of the of the of the process and the international or the independent international uh, independent uh, review panel. I feel the current system is too rigid and too perhaps maybe too dictatorial. Uh, I would be concerned that where a decision has been overturned on appeal, uh, that ruling has not changed. Uh, Thinking along the lines of the independent panel citing certain criteria uh, on their assessment and determination, which has not been lost on appeal, or sorry, has been lost on appeal. Is that successful appeal criteria amended to reflect that successful appeal, or does the original decision or reasons for that decision remain on the applicant's file? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having difficulty following the following the question in terms of the the criteria that you're referring to. Yeah, if you make a decision uh, and the criteria and the reasons for your decision is whatever, uh, and that is lost on appeal, uh, uh, and uh, do you amend your criteria to suit the, the loss, or does that remain on the applicant's file? Sorry, I'm 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 struggling with the, with the, with the question. Um, it, it, an appeal is lost by the department or by the farmer. By the department. Right. Well, where where we have um, rules, uh, scheme rules uh, in place, um, and we have applied those rules um, incorrectly. And uh, that is found by the panel. Certainly, we would uh, amend our interpretation or our practice around those those rules uh, for for case future cases of that of that type. Uh, but the sc the scheme rules remain as they are in regulation uh, for the most part. Um, I think it's. I'm not aware, I can't think of any particular cases in mind where we've got a, a rule completely wrong. Uh, this is really around our application of the rules to an individual set of circumstances. So we do seek to learn from, from, from those. Where a decision um, has been reversed um, or changed, I, I should say, uh, by the department following a panel hearing, then the decision is, is, is changed. You know, our records are amended uh, if it's, uh, if it's uh, uh, appropriate, uh, you know, a further scheme payment is issued, or a penalty is refunded, or whatever that happens, that happens to be. But mm -hmm. our records are amended following that, uh, following that, uh, that ultimate decision. So you're, you you would amend the the the, the uh, applicant's records accordingly as well to say that he had been penalised or whatever for whatever reason, which was overturned on appeal. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking of something else here that, uh, uh, and I have a reason for asking that particular question. But uh, how quickly uh, will the review be concluded? And any recommendations for changes implemented? Is there a time scale? The time scale is is uh, is that that I re referred to earlier, and that we would seek to have uh, new regulations um, in place by the end of the year uh, for the revised process. Um, and obviously, in in time for uh, prior to that, we will be consulting with with stakeholders and obviously engaging with the committee uh, again on the specifics of the changes. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thank you very very much, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jason. Just in relation to that, um, uh, the stakeholder engagement. When would you envisage uh, commencing that stakeholder engagement? Uh, I think we will uh, seek to to do that um, probably sometime uh, in the spring um, when we have some proposals uh, and some of the issues uh, teased out uh, that we can 
use as a basis to uh, to, to do that consultation uh, with stakeholders on. So it will be around some of the issues the committee has raised around the qualifications of the panel and uh, the uh, the basis of, of, of the panel's constitution, etc. So there's a number of issues that we'll need to, uh, to address. Um, obviously, me committee members have raised issues around retrospective application of, of this too. We'll need to frame that in, in a consultation document and I would hope we would we will try and do that uh, uh, during the spring. Well, that's, that, that's good, Jason, because this, this, uh, this is long awaited and certainly uh, there's been a great, um, I think there's been a good, uh, been very much welcomed, uh, the, the comments from the Minister that he uh, wants to, you know, with uphold the view of the independent panel and it's very welcome and very important that yourselves go out and robustly robustly engage with the those who, people who are impacted and then the stakeholder organizations as well as yourselves in the committee yeah we very much take that on board uh, chairman and, and and that's something we'll 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 do we want to ensure as far as possible that we get this right mm -hmm. yeah well um that's that's brilliant. Well, thank you very much um, um, for coming along here uh, this morning. We're sorry, we're into the afternoon here now, and uh, for for this here, and it was uh, de very detailed and very appreciated. And listen, as in the course of this consultation process, which is going to be kickstarted hopefully soon, then we look forward to certainly being very much a part of that there. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Take care. Um, okay. Okay, members. Um, before um, before we move on to item, can can we just uh, can we just um, go into close session briefly just to discuss just discuss a couple of matters relating to the forward work program? Is that okay? Um, can I suggest that you keep the closed session to the very end of the meeting. Yeah. That, that's okay. Keep it at the very end of the meeting. That probably makes more sense. Keep things flowing. Okay. 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 Item eight in the agenda here. Um, we have um, number the a departmental written briefing, uh, SR 2023 53, the Animals, Health, and Education, Trade, and Veterinary Medicines Amendment EU Eggs Regulations 2020. Uh, I want to refer to the memo from the clerk of page. There's no problem. Can people turn off their, their mutes, to one to mute, because there's a bit of interference going on there, whatever it is. Oh, well, we'll play on. Um, okay, so I want to refer to the memo from the track at page 101, and first from the department at page at 106. I want to advise members that the SL1 was considered uh, by the committee on the 17th of December, at which stage members of the committee were in the merit of policy, the rule is subject to a negative resolution procedure. The rule ensures that subordinate legislation in this jurisdiction relating to aquatic and animal health, trade and veterinary medicines can continue to operate effectively following the end of the transition period. It will ensure alignment with the EU obligations in these areas in accordance with the protocol. The examiner's other rules is highlighted in the report that the regulations have bro broken the 21-day rule, however, to satisfy the explanation provided by the department. Um, you know, uh, is members any comments? Rosemary has noted she, that she's opposed to this uh, particular SR. Do members have any comments they want to raise? Chair. Yeah, Chair. Go. Thanks. It's just, um, I'm thinking, I don't know if we can get this information though, but I, I, I'm wondering that if GB were able to commit to guaranteeing that they were able to uphold the same standards as us in NI under the, the EU level, um, of standards, would that be something that would be easier to return to the Joint Committee and allow NI and GB to, to trade more freely? For example, um, I'm just wondering about these third country rules. Um, it's just one of those, because I'm, I'm thinking of the Environment Bill and non-regression clauses and that. So if GB or um, the UK government were able to give a guarantee then to the EU that they would commit to upholding the same standards as apply in Northern Ireland, could that be something that the Joint Committee would be able to engage with discussions with the UK government on to try and fix a lot of the problems that we're seeing? I don't yeah. know. It's just something that came to me with that SI. Yeah. Uh, maybe Stella, we could uh, bring up the department. 
Stella, you lost her? No, she's here. No, sorry. Um, I think it's probably better to get a written response to that. Yeah. Um, obviously, the, the issue of um, level playing field and similar standards has been at the crux of the agreement um, of negotiations between the UK and the EU. So I, um, it's a very much a political matter, Claire, so it's probably a, a matter of getting um, a written response. Okay. You have yeah. enough there? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Rosemary, you, uh, yeah. Yeah. can you hear me? Yes, Rosemary, yeah. yeah. Thank you. No, I, I have concerns, and I'm voting against this. I have concerns in relation to, um, in relation to the importance of livestock and important of livestock, pedigree livestock, being brought from your sales in England, Scotland, over to Northern Ireland. There's issues in relation to that. Or if you bring in livestock to a sale, you'll not be in England or Scotland, you'll not be get fit to get them back. Uh, within a reasonable time. So I have concerns there. One thing I do want uh, clarified, and it, um, while this here results with animal medicines, with animal medicines cannot be licensed for UK totally. So this this here would say that animal, animal medicines can only be licensed for Great Britain. It does appear that the UK VDM can still authorise veterinary medicines for approval in Northern Ireland. Could you confirm that or get the department to confirm that? Yeah. We'll seek a written response. Seek a written response. Yeah. Um, William? Thank you. Uh, just no, no, I, I, I will, in line with Rosemary's comments, I, do, I have some concerns too, but I think it's very unfortunate. I mean, we've got some um, pedigree breeders who are going to shows in England and Scotland uh, bring out they bring animals over there to show and they don't sell them they can't get them back home so I mean there are issues around uh, and the protocol is part of blame or is to blame for this so that we we have certain issues on this too you know okay noted and um, given Given the level of interest, would members like a, a further oral briefing on this issue, not the SR, but on this actual issue? Yeah. 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 That'd be helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Claire, um, uh, if, if we're going to get that, could, could we require a difference being sought in relation to the uh, questions arising from the protocol? Could we get the briefing to indicate? what the alternative would be to, to not pass on the SR. But we really need to address this now. It's a, it really is a case of we are where we are. Um, I don't need any lessons on not being content with aspects of this because I'm not content with any aspects of it. Um, from 2016 onwards, and have made that perfectly clear. Um, like many others, uh, these issues were cautioned about on numerous occasions and with varying uh, responses. Uh, but I think we need to be clear that not to have processes in, in place is a potentially very risky situation. It might be helpful if um, officials, if we're asking for clarification, could clarify that risk also. Okay. Okay. So, okay, members. So, um, we'll, we'll put we'll, we'll put the we still put the question, Stella, or do we have to wait until we get that? No. Uh, no, you, you have to put the question. Declan, you're, you're out of time in this one. Um, do you want to go to closed session for five minutes? Yeah, okay. We're going to uh, close session just for a few minutes, okay? Can uh, broadcast and take us until uh, closed session, please? Fair enough. I am just checking broadcasting. You, you, you need to put the question on these three. Okay, right. So do we go to end open session again, Stella? Um, let me just check if we are open now. Um, we're live now. Okay, members. Um, okay, back to item eight, the uh, SR Animal, Animal Health and Education Trade and Regulations 2020. Um, okay, I'm going to put the question. Committee for Agriculture, Environment, Rural and Rural Concern, SR 2023 The Animals Health and Education Trade and Veterinary Amendment, the EU Exit Regulations, NA 20, and no objection to rule. I disagree. No good, yeah. Vote, vote against, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, item number nine is a written briefing, uh, SR 2023 
uh, the marketing of seed potato plant propagating material regulations. Uh, the memo was at page 119, papers from the Department of 121. Uh, one of the uh, members, the committee first considered the SL1 at the 10th of December, on the 10th of December, and was happy with the merits of the policy and it should progress to the next legislative stage. The rule is subject to negative resolution. Came into operation on the 31st of December. The purpose of the rule is to amend our plant health SRs in respect of regulated non quarantine pests, which are applicable to marketing within the EU and third countries listed to market in the EU regulatory zone. The examiner study rules is, is highlighted in a report. The regulation is broken the 21 day rule. However, she is satisfied with the explanation provided by the department. She has also highlighted the drafting error and has advised the department will be correcting this at the earliest opportunity. Members content, I put, put the question. The Committee for Agriculture, Rural and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2020 359, the marketing of seeds, potatoes, plants, and propagating material regulations, NA 2020. There's no objection to the rule. Okay. Okay, mm-hmm. item number uh, 10 on, on the agenda. Um, item, number, item number 10. Um, is the written briefing, the official controls uh, regulation, plant protection regulations 2020. Uh, the memos at page 135 and the papers at 137. I want to advise these regulations, the, the official controls plant protection products regulations, uh, were last considered by the committee at, on the 3rd of December and was content with the merits of policy and should move to the next legislative stage. The rule is subject to negative resolution and came into operation on the 31st of December 2020. The purpose regulations enforce the, uh, and apply EU regulations on official controls. This is in respect of pesticides, which, relate, uh, which regulates official controls uh, to ensure compliance of food and feed law, rules and animal health and welfare, plant health and plant protection products, and has been directly applicable in the UK from the 14th of December 2019. Uh, the executive rules highlighted in a report that the regulations have broken the 21-day rule but she is satisfied with the explanation provided to the department. Mm-hmm. Members are content to go put the question that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment, and Rural Affairs considered SR 202260, the official control of plant protection products regulations NA 2020, and there's no objection to the rule. Uh, can I vote against, Chair? Yep, noted. Okay, <laughs> happy enough. Okay, the uh, number 11 then uh, on, our, on our agenda is. Um, uh, sorry, Philip, can you have a question to uh, ask there? No? Hope you're on mute. Sorry, I was just very quick. My question's on this item 11. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, the fortnightly update, uh, pages 151 to 153 for the EU transition. transition. Um, again, any, any questions should be forwarded to the clerk. I thought you want to raise one here? Or raise yeah. question here? Uh, just, uh, Chair, in relation to I mean, the, the Environment Bill, uh, I mean, I, I note that it's been delayed uh, through Westminster and that's probably caused a bit of angst among uh, environmental groups and, and I, I, it would be useful because we've just got one line in that report. So I, I think it would be useful to write to the Department and ask for a written briefing on uh, the impact of the delay of the Environment Bill on legislation here in the North. I mean, I did a meeting yesterday with regard to my own uh, private members bill on uh, single-use plastics, but the issue of the deposit return scheme and things like that, which were uh, in the Environment Bill, are obviously now delayed. So can we, just to get a, a, an impact on what, what it might mean for the North and how it might impact on you know the end of this uh, mandate. Will we get the time to get the things that need to be done, done? Okay, Philip. Um, Stella, also, just when you're speaking there, Philip, um, I just was taking a look, uh, a look through that there as well. I, mean, I see the, the report been referenced to a transition program board and a food supply forum. I wonder, could we just get a wee bit more information from the department as to the functions of these, uh, who's on them, you know, what departments are involved. Just a bit more detail. Uh, would that be okay, Stella, or members? So. No problem. Could we just also include just on that as well? I, I mean, I know that it's going through all its stages here. We're on the third stage reading. Um, but in that briefing, can we get an update on all changes to the bill since, it last, since we last had sight of it? Well, thing. Okay. Thank okay, you. members, and uh, if, yeah. you, if, something that you, if there's something that you can think of, uh, John, are you looking in there? No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Uh, members, and if there's anything else that you, you want to raise that you, that you think of after the meeting, just send Stella a wee message okay. for the close of play today. Thank you. 
Members, item 12, correspondence, uh, pages 164 to 345 in the pack. I want to draw attention to the following. Correspondence from Hillmount Garden Centre, page 261. The owner is highlighting numerous issues that he is having due to Brexit. This is an issue that has been reported recently in the media and is having an impact on many of our garden centres. Will members be content if I wrote on behalf of the committee to, the, to Minister Eustace and to Minister Gove on this matter? And would members be content to seek either an oral or written briefing from the Horticulture Forum NA on this issue? And we can start, we, we, you know, we can discuss this further during the closed uh, for our program session if we want to as well. Is it okay? Um, for the correspondence from Brian Little, at page three thirty eight of the pack, and from uh, the MP Jim Shannon at page three forty two, Mr. Shannon is suggesting a number of people. Uh, from suggesting a number of people the committee may wish to seek evidence from in relation to the ongoing issue due to the independent review panel uh, on decisions. Mr Shannon suggests that a time scale for the committee to undertake its work on this matter. Can I ask members to take a few minutes to read the correspondence and to note that we will discuss this further in closed session? Okay. Um, the 21st re report from the examiner's statutory rules which has been tabled and advises that SR 2020 303 304 319 have been reported on and no issues have been identified. Attention has been drawn to SR 2020 328. Is there a tactical issue in respect to the numbering of the SR, which the department are currently working to rectify with the statutory publications office? Please already considered these SR subject to the SR report. Um, are members content to action the remainder of the correspondence suggested in the correspondence index? At page 156 to 162. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, that's true. Um, in terms of any other business, Patsy has an issue you wish to raise regarding the movement of pedigree rabbits from here to Britain and vice versa, and obviously the uh, the issue uh, to do with the Lockney Eels um, sales in Britain. Patsy, do you want to come in there? Yeah, well, um, Chair, uh, probably this could be dealt with if we're going to have a separate briefing from the department around these related issues uh, because I've been in contact by a person who's been in touch with me. They, um, believe it or not, breed pedigree rabbits, and which, which seems to be very successful for him up until this point. So if I could, with your forbearance on that occasion, when we receive that briefing from the department, if, if I could raise it then. Yep. I'm okay with that. I'm, is all the members okay with that? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The um, The... If members any other business before we're going to close session? Okay, we can just. Okay, so the date and time, the next meeting will take place uh, on Thursday, the 4th of February. We're going to go into a new month at 10 a.m. and will be uh, a virtual meeting uh, streamlined on the, the Assembly website. So thank you very much, members, and stay on board because we're going to just go back into the closed session again. Thank you. Uh, This is the North.